Kenny was a mother of two adult children. Kenny was a grandmother. Kenny worked for Kidney Health for nearly 20 years. He was confused. That reaction. Uh, he, as we were all standing out there in the right wing residence, he had shoved his hands in his front pants pockets and were shaking them, rubbing them back and forth in a very fast manner. She was, um, she was looking at you, of course. Please note that this content is for adults only. Viewer discretion advised. If you haven't yet, Hit the subscribe, like, and share. Hello everyone and welcome back to another live stream with me, Gizela K. This is Grizzly True Crime and today we're going to be watching Day 9 of the Daniel Howard trial together, which is taking place in Idaho. He is a former Idaho State Police trooper, as well as a former Marine, who is on trial for the murder of his wife, Candy Howard. You, you can see pictured, <laughs> I was going to, wrong side, this side, pictured up here. And there's also going to be banners for you up here, as there has been throughout the trial, okay? So if you feel lost, or if it's your first time here with us today, then please check out the description box. There's a case background write-up for you. And then you can also check out the playlist. All the other days are defluffed, okay? So it means there's no lunch breaks or coffee breaks or paper flapping and long pauses and things like that because I edit those out for us. And then there's also, you know, no ads throughout the long trial day either. So that's great too. So, and it's timestamp. So you can check out the pinned comments. You can check out the description box. We'll hover over the video. Okay, so welcome to all my moderators. Thank you so much for everything you do. Welcome to all my patrons, members, uh, YouTube members. We are probably going to have a YouTube members only live stream today after the stream, okay? I'm saying probably because they should see how this goes <laughs> today, uh, energy-wise and everything. But I think we're going to have one today. So just make sure you check out your notifications for that. I'll let you know at the end as well, okay? So if you can only pop in and out, pop in later towards the end. All right, so are we ready? Uh, welcome to all my subscribers. Please like, share, so others know we are live. Let me just bring up the footage that I've made for you, which, wow, it's really... It's Steve Luft. <laughs> there was a lot of fluff on this day. Yes, indeed. Let me show you. We've got it here. And the total trial day is 3 hours and 35. Pretty good, right? And I think we might get a little snarky. <laughs> we were all getting a little snarky yesterday with those last two witnesses. I was like, are these people lying? Wow, those stories, I even had to re-watch some of it. I'm like, um, yeah, no, I don't know about any of that. If you missed it, go check it out. All right, so let me get the sound going here for you. I boosted it as much as possible, so I hope it's good. And let's start with day nine. Wait, got to tell you one more thing. The actual courtroom today, like real time, is they're having a day off today because the defense, they were done with their witnesses for Thursday. That was yesterday, okay, for day nine. And then the next witness they have is an expert that can only be there on Monday. So there's no live court feed today, which is great because we're one day behind. So we're going to watch day nine now. And on Monday, they're going to resume with day nine and then the defense expert. Okay. All right, let's go. Um, this is 
more discussions about Dr. Howard, who is the guy who initially performed the the medical examiner on Candy Howard and then determined her manner of death as undetermined. He said it was undetermined, whereas um, other medical examiners said, no, this was a homicide. <laughs> so he's going to be on, on the stand. Use my voice here for a second. He's going to be on the stand. It's going to be quite interesting. Information from what I was considering yesterday, what was your report yesterday, uh, the state was understandably upset at not having been informed about this and you're concerned about how how Dr. Howard's opinion, what it may be, and your ability to cross-examine him uh, based on this new information. I've indicated to counsel um, that I'm still not inclined to exclude Dr. Howard for largely the reasons I consider yesterday, though I think it is a little bit more concerning today. Uh, but nonetheless, I think the prejudice of the state uh, in this circumstance does not outweigh the defendant's due process right to present his defense. In that, even, even with this new information, Mr. Johnson has indicated Dr. Howard's opinion uh, does not change and is still the same as in his coroner's report and that is all that. And trust me, the state is not happy about this, <laughs> that Dr. Howard is actually going to get to testify. Yeah, he's gonna. And you know what's so weird? You know, yesterday when they said, they call to the stand, Mr. John Howard. I was like, Mr. John Howard. Isn't the doctor's name also John Howard? Yes. So Daniel Howard's father's name is John Howard. Okay. And then this uh, medical examiner's name is Dr. John Howard. Oh my goodness. Okay, so I'm just going to go off the camera for a second because I forgot two things. Very important, okay? My necklace <laughs> and my coffee. I'll be right back, okay? I'll be very quick. Mr. Johnson is intending to listen to uh, and As I explained yesterday, given the uh, given the, the state's knowledge of Dr. Howard's opinion uh, throughout the, the entirety of this case, I, I don't think that the prejudice is great enough to uh, warrant exclusion of the witness. I did indicate I would uh, allow the state any remedy of needing additional time and so forth. Um, the state took some time and has indicated they are prepared to proceed. Uh, I indicated yesterday I was considering a monetary sanction on counsel. Uh, I, I am going to impose a sanction on counsel for uh, this lack of compliance. But I'm going to discuss that. With, I'll discuss that with counsel at the end of the case. But I, I am going to sanction conduct because I don't think it's appropriate, and I think it's somewhat strategic. Um, I, I'm not saying this Johnson is acting. I'll just say I think it's I think it warrants sanction, but um, I, I, I think maybe there was some misunderstanding of. The application of the rule. I'm not sure. I'll leave it at that. Um, Mr. Johnson, did you want to put anything else on the record regarding that or clarification? Uh, just on the record, Your Honor, um, when asked yesterday about experts uh, from a defense standpoint, uh, we were not considering, even though there was a, a CB, we were not considering, considering Ace Abito as an expert. She didn't offer an expert opinion. She was a fact witness, came out as a fact witness at trial. And so, um, when asked about sharing expert opinions, that was my answer. Uh, in further complication of uh, contemplation, that's what I brought to the courts and counsel's attention. That's awesome. Thank you. Ms. Schatzfeld, did you want to put anything else on the record? Yes, Your Honor. Um, as the court noted, the state did renew its objection um, and request that Dr. Howard be excluded. We do believe that there is prejudice to the state based on um, both the violation of Rule 16 as well as um, the sort of trickle of, of information that's been coming from defense as it relates to what Dr. Howard may or may not have been provided. State likewise takes issue with the um, 
condescending approach to Chief Deputy Coroner Lynn Acevedo. She was noticed as an expert. She testified as an expert. Counsel objected to her opinions, which were overruled at times because she was well qualified as an expert. And so even now, counsel's disparaging comments are unnecessary. And I just note for the record that she was so properly noticed and so testified. Thank you. Thank you. All right. With that, we'll bring the jury to the conclusion. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Sure. Do you? Yes, Judge, I would agree that there is, that that portion is accurate. I have no objection to admitting the st state's version. Well, here's what, my ruling is going to be you're, you're welcome to, I'll allow you to admit Exhibit F, but the state is certainly within their rights on the prosecutor to admit the rest of the conversation. Absolutely. Fair, so. Sure. Okay. All right. Uh, I'll give these back to you, and then will you give them a shot to all the first time? Yes, sir. It's quite hectic when you look at that body cam that we saw, you know, my goodness, of <laughs> Daniel Howard. You know, he had that moustache and he just had a very different demeanor away about him then. Of course, he was performing as well. But here he looks very like, I don't know how to describe it. Every time they show his side profile, he just he keeps looking at the jury and just like, like as if he's, as if he's the victim, isn't it? Mm-hmm. All right, I've overruled the foundation objection. Uh, defendants exhibit F is admitted. Uh, can we strike that, Your Honor? Um, I'm going to. So you're not going to present exhibit F? No, Your Honor. Um, yeah, go ahead. You know? Mr. Fitting, uh, that's a same conversation, but uh, a little more uh, to it in a little different format. Do you see that? Yes. Okay. Um, it's, Defense Exhibit G, we move to admit Defense Exhibit G. Any objection? No objection, Your Honor. Just for the record, um, that exhibit was originally worth the plaintiff's sticker. Uh, Mr. Johnson's now utilizing it, but we would ask it to be admitted under defense's notation. Is that when I look at a state's 57? Yes, ma'am. We'll call that Defendant Exhibit G. Yes, ma'am. Okay. That is admitted. I have no further questions. May I uh, retrieve it to you? Cross examination. Uh, publish defense G. Okay. That is defense G is published. Any other cross examination? Just briefly. This poor guy, they're not asking him much, huh? Do you see these messages? Did you have Facebook interactions with Kenny? Yep. And then the rest are just like, look at him, he's like, what is what am I here for? Mr. Fitting, were you and Kendi Howard close? No. Was she more of a long-time acquaintance than a close friend? Yes. That, have you not seen her much in the however many years? I hadn't seen her for 30 years, actually probably 35, 40 years. And I ran into her and her family while I was down steelhead fishing. Said hi to her. She sent me a request on Facebook to friend her, so I did, and we just kind of picked up and started having casual conversation like anybody would. How, um... Like, why did the defense attorney pick this guy to be one of his witnesses? I mean, he's only got nine witnesses, okay, and this is one of them? And he hasn't seen Kenny in like 30 or 40 years, he said? Sorry, what? He knew her in school, like in younger days, and then picked up some conversations on Facebook. Okay. How far before this conversation was that run in fishing? It's like three weeks. Thank you. No other questions. Any redirect, Mr. Johnson? Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kitty. You're welcome, sir. As best we can, let's take it aside. Ooh, and now we've got Dr. Howard. Yes, we're a little snarky already <laughs> about him. You know, because he didn't take note of the 30 injuries that Candy had on her body. If he had taken that into account, you know, and all the other clues, he wouldn't have ruled her death as undetermined, is what the other medical examiner said, right? So, <laughs> Mallory Beaver said, he's honest, at least, yeah, at least there's been an honest one. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so, here we go. Good morning, Mr. Good morning, Doctor. Good morning. Can you please state your name and spell your last name for the record? My name is John Dale Howard, H-O-W-A-R-D. Any relation to Mr. Daniel Howard? No. Uh, where do you live? Boise, Idaho. Uh, what did you do for work? I'm currently retired. I was previously a forensic pathologist and medical examiner. Can you, um, where did you do that? Well, after completing my formal tr medical training, I was the assistant medical examiner for Pierce County in Tacoma, Washington. I then took a position in Tucson, Arizona, 
with the Pima County Medical Examiner's Office. I was also on faculty of the University of Arizona College of Medicine. I was then asked to take a position as the Chief Deputy Coroner, Director of Forensic Pathology, and Director of the Forensic Pathology Fellowship Training Program for Hamilton County in Cincinnati, Ohio. I also served on the faculty of the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine. I was then asked to return to Tacoma as the Chief Medical Examiner which I served as uh, in Pierce County, Tacoma, Washington, for a decade before uh, coming to this side of the mountains uh, to join a medical school classmate in the Spokane County of Medical Examiners as a forensic pathologist and medical examiner. Can you take us through your educational background? Excuse me? Can you take us through your educational background? Certainly. I have a uh, bachelor's degree in chemistry from Central Washington University. I attended the University of Washington School of Medicine in Seattle, graduating in 1982 with the medical doctor MD degree. I stayed on with the University of Washington as affiliated hospitals, uh, clinics, and training programs for a year of general surgery residency training, three years of anatomic pathology training, and two years of fellowship training in forensic pathology with the University of Washington and the King County Medical Examiner's Office in Seattle. Uh, have you had any publications? Yes. Can you give uh, a little bit of what you've published? I published in peer-reviewed journals on a, a variety of, of subjects uh, related to forensic medicine and forensic pathology. Okay. Have you testified since retiring? Yes. Can you briefly explain the circumstances? Uh, I've been asked seven times to uh, come out of retirement and testify in homicide trials. I was called by the prosecutor. I had performed the autopsy and was asked, because I had performed the autopsy, to, to testify, and I agreed to do so and did so. Is this uh, your eighth time testifying since retiring then? This would be the eighth time. Will they be 14 times? <laughs> um, anyway, what are we going to say now? Now I lost my train of thought as I was pausing to say something to you. Uh, I think I was going to say, imagine Dr. Lewis, Dr. Howard, on a coffee date together. My word, <laughs> the conversations they'll have. Any prior um, testimony or, or experience with inner oral gunshot wounds? Uh, gunshot wounds uh, of the face and mouth, I, I certainly have uh, encountered those at autopsy uh, numerous times and uh, testified more than once. Have you ever testified for the state of Idaho for uh, a homicide? Yes. Uh, now, is it common in your experience as a medical examiner to be called by uh, defense? Well, sometimes uh, you're called first by the prosecution uh, when they're put on their case, and once in a long while, usually the, the defense covers everything in their cross-examination. Uh, once in a long while, uh, they may recall that witness during their presentation of the case, and that's happened a few times, uh, but only a few out of the more, more than 900 times I've testified. Okay. He's testified 900 times. Well, I remember what I was going to say now. Complacency is a killer. That's what we always say, right? It's like uh, complacency is really not a good thing. At the end of his career there, it seemed like he was completely complacent. And they said, actually, in opening statements, short-timer syndrome. He just really didn't care about his job anymore. And just was, you know, ruling uh, manners of death just undetermined or just wrong that he had to actually be investigated for 14 determinations that he made. So it's like, have you been called by the defense before? Not, not in a long while, but testified 900 times in his career. Is there a uh, process of involvement between law enforcement and the state and the medical examiner's office? Well, medical examiners have uh, jurisdiction over sudden, unnatural, unexpected, unexplained deaths. Uh, same as a coroner, you know, medical examiners just have a medical training, medical degree. Uh, in this case, 
this was a coroner case, a Kootenai County coroner case. Spokane County and Kootenai County have long had a inter-county arrangement where the coroner can refer cases in to autopsy to Spokane where those autopsies are performed by a forensic pathologist. Uh, Spokane County does that for a number of Panhandle counties and a number of Eastern Washington counties. Did you, uh, uh, well, can you explain the general process of an autopsy? Certainly. The term autopsy literally means to see for oneself. It's for the pathologist to examine the body of the deceased to help determine who they are, when and where events happened that, and processes happened that led to their death to help determine whether they have any natural disease, any developmental abnormalities, any kind of injury to help formulate cause of death opinions or identify the cause of death and develop information that helps understand the circumstances in which the, or the manner in which the death occurred. What happens after an autopsy is complete? Well, during the autopsy, uh, there are documentations made, uh, radiographs or x-rays are taken, uh, photographs are taken at various stages during the autopsy procedure, uh, samples are collected to submit for toxicology uh, testing, then uh, some samples, uh, uh, biopsy tissue samples are placed into fixative, uh, formaldehyde water mixture to be held. Uh, portions of tissues are processed into a glass slide that can be examined under a microscope. Once the examination is completed and all those samples, as well as trace evidence like hair samples, swabs, fingernail trimming, once that's all been processed in the autopsy suite, the body is released to a funeral home. Now, is the performance of, uh, um, did you perform an autopsy on Miss Kendi Howard? I did. And when was that? That was February 3rd of the year 2021. <coughs> was law enforcement present for that autopsy? I believe someone, uh, the, the autopsy suite has observation rooms where law enforcement can uh, observe through the window, yes. Are photos taken uh, at the time of the autopsy? Yes, at various stages from the very start uh, and subsequent multiple stages after the start. Uh, may I approach Madam Clerk, Your Honor? Does law enforcement uh, give you any information prior to the conducting an autopsy? Well, this was a coroner case, so the coroner entered the uh, case information into the computer system at the medical examiner's office, and that would Certainly, uh, since they were at the scene and uh, working with law enforcement, include some of that information. What is an external examination? External examination means uh, at the start of the autopsy, uh, the body in a sealed body bag is on a cart wheeled into the autopsy suite. The uh, tag is looked at to ensure that it hasn't been broken. It is then broken and the body bag's open, and the external examination, meaning just looking at the outer surface of the body, begins. But you didn't do that. You didn't take note of all the injuries. Is it important to do an external examination before an autopsy? Well, it's at the very start before you alter the body in any way by making any surgical type incisions, yes. Okay. The doctor, you said uh, photos were taken uh, were photos taken at the autopsy? Yes, either by myself or by the two autopsy assistants working with me under my direction. Okay, so I'm going to run through a series of photos and you can just tell me if you recognize them. Do you recognize these? Yes, they were photographs taken at the time of the autopsy. All right, doctor, these have been admitted into uh, evidence already. Um, is one of the things you look for is rigor? Yes. The, Post-mortem changes, rigor mortis is a stiffening of the muscles due to chemical changes occurring after death. So that is one of the things that you assess. It relates in general to how long the person's been dead. Okay. And was rigor present in Ms. Howard? Yes. 
Now, what is lividity? Lividity is the pooling of blood inside intact blood vessels after death under the force of gravity. So whatever position the body is in, when the heart stops, circulation stops, blood, which is a mixture of cells and fluid, behave like a fluid, and like any fluid, under gravity, seek to the lowest spot. Now, it will then show up as vascular congestion, which looks like a purple discoloration of the skin. It will not form where there's pressure, so like the buttocks, if someone's... He's still claiming her. Jason Johnson is like, he's still, he's still explaining, Your Honor. Still explaining. Just let him. Objection. Well, that objection was overruled. So it doesn't tend to form where the, there's pressure, uh, but whatever part is dependent, meaning the lowest by gravity, it'll start to show up. Now, it's not necessarily fixed in the first hours or in the first, necessarily the first day of death, after death, uh, so it can shift if the body moves. But it's just a postpartum appearance of discoloration of the skin from blood vessels, pooling of blood under gravity. Was there uh, blood present uh, when you uh, removed Ms. Howard from the bag, the sealed bag? Yes. Uh, blood was pooled in the body bag and was on the body surface. I'm showing you 28. Is this, um, can we have the lights on? Can you see that photo? If you need to step up into the well here. Thank you, Your Honor. I have seen the photo. And, um, can you... Okay, so all these jump cuts are obviously editing, so we don't waste time waiting for him to get up, walk where we can't see him, look at the photo, come back to the seat. Yeah, okay, so carry on. You see the hair up there? Yes. And can you describe uh, what you observed and, and what's shown in that photo? The, the hair is wet and uh, blood present throughout the scalp hair. Now, in the, uh, you do examine the head and neck? Yes. Okay. Um, what is petechiae? Petechiae are pinpoint hemorrhages that can be seen after death or even in a live patient. Uh, when there's vascular compromise, meaning blood vessels, the veins are collapsed in an area, but there's still arterial pressure going to that area. The circulation of blood stops because of the occlusion of the veins, and small blood vessels rupture, producing a pinpoint hemorrhage. This is most commonly seen in strangulations where compression is put on the neck such that the veins of the neck are compressed and occluded. Blood cannot return back to the heart, but there's still arterial pressure to the head at every point above where that pressure is applied, occluding the veins, are at risk of having those pinpoint hemorrhages seen, most easily seen in the whites of the eyes because of the translucent tissue. If you look in your own eye, you can see blood vessels that's where it's most commonly seen. It can be seen anywhere in the face, the neck, or uh, in the oral mucosa. Uh, in other cases of same... Objects to narrative. Objection. 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 Uh, or, and there's pressure on the chest, you may see petechiae all above that level. Uh, the other classic case is the back, backyard mechanic who jacks up his car, gets underneath, the jack fails, it comes down, it doesn't crush your chest. Objection, non-responsive and narrative. Overall non-responsive, but this is getting into narrative. This is quite far afield of your initial question, so I'll ask you to draft the testimony. 
my. <laughs> the the state is not having it. Objection. <laughs> Goes off on his narrative. Also smiling while telling all these stories. Right? But we already heard from Dr. Smock. Dr. Smock was so good. Remember? Uh, the state's witness. This is obviously now the defense presenting their case. And everything we learn from Dr. Smock is just much more informative. Right? Did you observe? I'm not trying to compare the two doctors necessarily. I'm saying we already learned about this petechiae, the evidence, and from many witnesses, I think the state has already presented the case really well. Of course, the defense has to do their best, but I think shame. I think it's a slam dunk. What do you think? Were there any petechiae in the sound? No. Were there any uh, lines or markings going around her body? Yes. Can you describe that? When a body is uh, subjected to being submerged uh, in water, at least partly, you can see where there's relative hydration of the skin, water markings, and there were lines of uh, skin discoloration uh, indicating where the water line was with, above that, no, no contact with water, below that, there was submersion in water of the skin. And you could see those, uh where in her body or on her body could you see those lines? Well, there are a number of them, mostly uh, vis most readily visible on the trunk. Were they also on the legs? Yes. Now, uh, did you observe any abrasions? Yes. Where was that? There was an abrasion on the posterior or back of her left thumb. Showing you what's been emitted as... 20W. Is this a picture of the abrasion? Yes. This is a photograph taken at the time of autopsy of her left thumb, if I may. Sure. I can point out the abrasion. Sure. So her thumbnail is here. So the back of the thumb the abrasion is here, as I've indicated, with my finger. Now, is there a difference between an abrasion and a laceration? Well, abrasion is just the surface of the skin being broken. A laceration is a tear of the skin, but it would be deeper. Now, did you find any evidence of a gunshot wound? I did. Uh, what were your observations? Well, first of all, uh, bullet fragments were visible uh, in the x-rays taken prior at just you know, the period before the autopsy and were reviewed. And then direct examination externally of the mouth showed bruising of her lips, uh, blood present uh, it, inside the oral cavity. And then as a part of the autopsy, internal dissections are made, the chest, abdomen, head, and neck. And the neck structures are looked at in place and then are dissected and removed and further examined. There was gunshot wound with damage passing through her tongue. The bullet had gone posteriorly or backward causing a gaping defect in the back of her throat, the pharynx. And then the bullet had broken in pieces, but the main portion had gone through her spinal column, the cervical spine, and transected the spinal cord. The bullet fragments had stayed in the body and then were able to be seen and recovered by the dissection of the neck from the front and dissection of the neck from the back. There was hemorrhage in the tissues surrounding and blood that was pooled in the throat, the mouth, and the nasal passages around the tongue and pharyngeal or throat defects. So he said tongue twice. Now ask him, ask him the question. I know it's the defense though, so he probably won't. But it's quite odd that this medical examiner performed the autopsy, said her death, uh, Kenny's death was undetermined, right? The manner of death. Even though there's so many injuries and everything, and other medical examiners later said this was a homicide. But yet, even though he's like, he was lazy with his work at the end, is one way to put it. <laughs> Complacent. Finished. Just wanted to get out of there. He saved her tongue which helped other medical examiners look closely at that evidence 
and come to their conclusions. That is so strange that he did that. I hope somebody asks him about that. Is there any fouling? Yes. What is fouling? Fouling is the soot deposits from a firearm. And when a firearm is discharged, the cartridge contains primer residue. The firing pin hits the cartridge. The that residue ignites the gunpowder. The gunpowder burns very rapidly, but not completely. The hot expanding gas propels the bullet out of the cartridge, down the barrel, and out of the muzzle. Do you object at this point, lack of foundation for this answer beyond the scope of expertise? Your Honor, he's testified in thousands of homicide uh, cases, a lot of them dealing with guns. I'm actually 900. <laughs> You didn't listen, Jason. You said 900. <laughs> Shots. I think there's adequate foundation based upon his training experience. Why would you ask for the foundation? Are you familiar with the operation of firearms? Yes, that was part of my uh, training uh, during uh, my forensic pathology fellowship, including test firing of weapons. And I've worked with firearms examiners in multiple agencies, uh, also test firing weapons. Permission to continue. Okay. Uh, can you continue to explain what fouling is? So fouling is the soot or smoke that comes out of the muzzle of the weapon along with the bullet. And if the muzzle is close enough to the skin or the inside of the mouth in this case, it deposits on the tissue and shows a dark discoloration. You can actually see the gunshot, uh, gunshot residue uh, with the naked eye and confirm it under the microscope. You mentioned um, there was damage to the tongue? Yes. Now, it may seem like a simple question, but is the tongue a muscle? Yes. What happens to... <laughs> it may seem like a simple question, but is the tongue a muscle? Sometimes the questions that uh, Mr. Johnson asks are very like, curious, like, okay, what is lividity? <laughs> It's almost like he wants to know. He just sounds like a curious kid sometimes, right? I don't think that's right for this scenario, but you know what I mean. Muscles when uh, a person passes. They relax and uh, just stay in whatever position unless external forces or gravity changes it. Was there anything significant about your examination of the tongue? Well, uh, I saw the uh, bruising of the lips. There was a fracture of her mandible. Uh, when you have a bullet passes through tissue, there's kinetic energy converted to the mechanical yes, and hydrostatic. What was significant about the, uh, anything, what was the damage to the tongue? We're going to hear that answer now. Um, it's just, it's, when, every time that Dr. Howard looks at the judge, <laughs> it looks like he knows he was naughty there, right? He's like, what? Am I going to be allowed to speak some more? <laughs> yes. The bullet had passed through the tongue, uh, tearing the tissue apart. Uh, was it from the tip or top, or bottom? Uh, it passed from the, near the front, towards the back. Now, uh, you did a neck dissection in this case? Yes. And that was from the rear? Front and rear. Okay. When you do a neck dissection from the rear, what do you have to do? First, you uh, turn the body over so it's initially in a supine or resting on its back, place it in a prone position, uh, cleanse the body so that you can do a, a thorough external examination of the head and neck and then proceed with surgical incisions in the back of the neck. While a person is, while a body is on, uh, rolled over, what happens with the blood? Well, blood will, any blood that's in uh, the nose and mouth will uh, purge out and uh, 
in, in terms of blood that's still in the blood vessels, under gravity will start to shift towards the front of the body from the back. Did you examine the head? Yes. What does that entail? First, you carefully examine and palpate the scalp. Then a scalpel is used to make an incision, as I'm indicating on my head, across the scalp, above the ears. The scalp is then reflected forward and backward so that the deep layers of the scalp can be directly examined. You cut through the tissue to do that. Then the outer surface of the skull can be directly examined. I'm showing you what's been emitted as 20M. Do you see see this photo? Yes. And is that does that cause uh, pressure or what are you looking for when you do that? Why why do you do that in a case like this? So the deep layers of the scalp, the muscles uh, that are applied to the head and the skull surface itself can be directly seen and therefore directly examined. Okay. You see these two marks at the, the bottom there? Objection beyond the scope of the court's prior rulings. It's explained as autopsy. Counsel is about to ask for an opinion on something that is not contained in Dr. Howard's original report. There you are. Maybe approach. Um, yeah. You can see it. Which means the jury's out again. I think. <laughs> I'll leave that door slam in there for us so that I'm like, oh, the jury's out again. Oh, dear. That the state's really getting fed up, right? Because there's parameters in which Jason Johnson can ask questions and he's he keeps on just, <laughs> just trying to go outside of those boundaries, you know? So imagine being, you know, a coroner or a medical examiner or forensic pathologist, like Dr. Howard's career, whoa, all the things that he's done and seen. It must be, I don't know, quite depressing, right? Is it court? All right, and Mr. Johnson, what did, well, you can make your objection, Shasta. Thank you, Your Honor. So the... <coughs> The question that the state anticipated, and in conferring with Mr. Johnson at the bench, seems to be an accurate prediction. But Mr. Johnson is now going to be showing Dr. Howard things that were not noted by Dr. Howard in his autopsy report and asking for his opinion as to what those are. That is new information. That is new opinion. Those are the types of questions that would have been discovered in an expert report. The entire the entire containment that was articulated by this court was that Dr. Howard was going to testify to the opinions contained within this report. One of those opinions is to cause of death. However, he is here testifying as a medical expert and being asked medical expert opinions such as, what is this? Is this part of the autopsy or is this some kind of blunt force trauma? He's going to be asked, is this a contusion or is this lividity? If those are not specifically articulated in the report, then they are new opinions, Judge. Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Your Honor. I do not plan on asking about any contusions, if, if it's a contusion or not. Um, uh, the uh, lividity, I was not going to ask him specific photos, if they're lividity or not. Uh, what uh, I was simply wanting him to do, which he does have, in his opinion, that transsection that had, or the, the examination of the head and neck, and I was asking him what those are. Um, that's, if the court wants, I can move on, um, but. What did you anticipate the answer to be? Anticipating the answer that that is, that is not, uh, that that is the normal process of uh, peeling back the scalp and, uh, and part of the incisions that would be made or hemorrhages that would be uh, obtained at that time. Um, it, I'm not asking of him um, anything about contusions. Those are in his report. If I, I mean, I'm assuming if I did ask him, he would be consistent with his report. Dr. Howard, just so I understand, what would your answer have been? What the photograph shows is the undersurface of the scalp where it's 
been sharply dissected. There's some very small amounts of bleeding from a cut vessel. It's typical of what is seen at every autopsy. It's a postmortem leakage of blood because the blood vessels that were intact previously are cut in order to reflect the scalp. And this is this is the only one I was going to ask about. Judge, the only reason to ask that question is to impeach Dr. Smock, who testified that he would indicate that those are the result of blunt force trauma. That is a new opinion, Judge. It is. I'm fine with you asking him if he observed the injuries to the scalp or head because that's what in his report. Um, what, I'm, what I'm going to limit, which I think is fair, is an attempt to impeach other witnesses' testimony on these photos with his testimony, which goes beyond his report. So I'll allow you to ask if he observed signs of injury to the scalp or head. That's fine because that's within his report. And certainly this is all within his expertise. Uh, but using it to impeach other witnesses um, going into specifics beyond his report, I will limit that given the, um, the, the, the surprise to the state and your failure to disclose that previously. Um, in, in an exercise of my discretion, I do think that those aspects, uh, as we talked about, going beyond his report, I do think is prejudicial uh, to the state and not yeah, able to meet that. But I, on the whole, I'm certainly have allowed you to present Dr. Howard and his testimony consistent with his autopsy. So, all right. Uh, let's take about five minutes, ten minutes if people need, five to ten minutes for our morning break. Teleport, teleport. Okay, so we went forward there. They took <laughs> quite a few breaks there today because like, jury in, jury out. In and out, as someone said, judge has a revolving door for the jury in this case. I wonder how the jury feels about that. Like, oh my word, here we go again. We're going outside. Okay, we're back in. Oh, we're being sent out again. <laughs> so, doctor, you uh, you examined the head. Yes. Uh, any? Did you observe any or document any injuries to the head? The gunshot wound to the head and uh, the alterations related to it, such as the fracture of the mandible and the bruising of the lips and the internal injury. I did not find any other head injury. Okay. What is a histology section? Histology means uh, the study of tissues. It usually refers to examination of tissues under a microscope. And what what are you looking for when you're looking at the histology section? Well, like the autopsy in general, the microscopic exam, you're looking for any sign of abnormal development, any indication of natural disease, and any type of injury. Okay. Were those done in this case? They were done in this case, yes. Did you, uh, were there any uh, histology uh, findings or, or uh, things that you noticed? Yes. And what were they? Examination of tissue from the tongue showed tissue disruption, hemorrhage, and gunshot residue present. Uh, the examination uh, microscopically of tissue from the spinal cord uh, also showed tissue disruption and hemorrhage. Now, in autopsies in general, are there times where you'll keep specimens? Yes, routinely uh, samples are collected or biopsy specimens that uh, are processed into the glass slides for microscopy. Other representative samples of places of injury and the major organs uh, and structures are also retained in uh, formalin, which is formaldehyde in one. In Ms. Howard's case, was there a particular area of injury that was maintained as a specimen? As I recall, the tongue was handled in that manner. What happens, um, uh, what happens when you remove, say, the tongue? How does it get from there to from out high? Well, it's taken out onto uh, the dissecting table part of the autopsy. Your Honor, this is once again beyond the scope. Your Honor, I have 
Mm-hmm. Make it in. Yeah. So it's been removed by dissection from the body, examined on the dissecting table, samples collected for microscopy, and it's rinsed, examined again, and then placed with the other tissues in fixative. In fixative being the formaldehyde? Yes. Did you conduct toxicology in this case? Well, samples were obtained from autopsy for the purpose of toxicology testing. They were submitted to a laboratory who did the testing. Did you, on the histology uh, specimens, did you notice any damage to the spinal cord? Yes. You said the autopsy was conducted on um, February 3rd? Yes. Uh, Do you know what time? Well, it started at... I recorded the start at 11.39 hours. It took several hours to perform. Did you do a report that day? Well, I dictated my findings on the day of the autopsy. That's transcribed in the report, and then additional uh, information, such as the toxicology and the microscopic findings, are then placed into the report report is then proofread and finalized and signed on the day after the autopsy, several days. In this case, it was the, I believe, February 16th when I signed the autopsy report. Any law enforcement involvement prior to finalizing the report? Not that I recall. Did you have any findings uh, from your autopsy? Yes. And what were they? It is part of the autopsy report. There's a page which has basically the findings or conclude, basic conclusions of what was observed. And that was twofold in this case. One is the intraoral gunshot wound of the head and neck with transection of the spinal cord. And that uh, there's a notation about the toxicology finding caffeine, but no drugs or alcohol detected. And then the next section of the autopsy report is an opinion section. Were there any other, other than the, well, let me qualify, there was damage to the tongue, correct? Yes. And that would uh, uh, cause some bleeding? Objection in the form of the question. It is bleeding, so I'll ask you to rephrase the question. What's the, would there be bleeding if, uh, with an injury to the tongue like that? Yes, the bullet had perforated the tongue, and so there was autopsy evidence of hemorrhage or bleeding into the tissues and out of the open wound. Was there bleeding in other areas? Well, the bleeding extended from where the bullet passed through into the muscle of the tongue all the way down to the upper neck. I'm showing you again what's marked as 20A. Is is that blood where is that blood part of that injury that you just mentioned to the tongue and the neck? The source of bloody of the blood that's visible on the exterior of the body, the outside. The only two sources are the perforation of the tongue and the wound in the back of the throat. Those are the open wounds that allow bleeding to occur into the oral cavity and then spill out of the nose and mouth. Was there any blood found in the stomach? No. Is that the amount of blood uh, that you see or uh, saw? Is that cons- Objection to the question as beyond the scope. I'll actually ask you to approach. <laughs> All right, the, the question wasn't quite finished. Um, I'm sustaining objection. I'll rephrase it. Ask you to rephrase Of course, you know, the judge is being, <laughs> that's his job, extremely fair, you know. So you can hear the state is very upset in objection and many objections and just like, what is he saying now? But many of the objections have been overruled because uh, the judge has to make sure it's fair, that it's within the boundaries, you know, of the questions and the answers so that there's no mistrial or appeals or something else. 
Was the amount of blood that you observed consistent with an interim oral gunshot wound? Yes. Did you reach a opinion or conclusion in this matter? I did. And what was that? We are asked as a part of this process from the coroner in, in providing autopsy services as a forensic pathologist to render an opinion as to the cause of death and specific natures of, of the wound. And I did so in this case. Were you subpoenaed in this case? What's that? Objection? Relevance? Sustained. No further question. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Could I ask Mr. Johnson to turn off his Ooh, are we ready for this cross-examination, right? Take a deep breath, everyone. Buckle up. I'm ready. Here we go. Dr. Howard, you indicated that you performed this autopsy on February 3rd, around 11.30 in the morning. Is that, that correct? That's when it started, correct. And you were made aware at the time of your autopsy that the um, date of pronouncement was February 2nd, the day before, correct? Correct. Were you made aware of the time of pronouncement? Not that I recall. It may have been in the, uh, the records entered by the coroner. I don't recall the time. Were you aware that it had been less than 12 hours since you'd been pronounced dead? You said I don't recall. It would not surprise me. And Kenny's body arrived at your facility, um, which is in Spokane, correct? Yes. Um, were you made aware of where the body had traveled from? Uh, it was probably in the coroner's record. I don't recall. But you knew that it was a Kootenai County case, so it at least had come from this side of the line? Yes. And the body would have been transported by the coroner of Kootenai County, is that correct? Coroner or transport service, correct. Um, isn't it common um, during transport um, for bodies that may have large injuries to leak blood? Yes. Um, wouldn't it be common for a body that had been submerged in water um, to have some moisture to it? That would be expected, yes. Um, so would it be fair to say that some of that blood that is seen in the body bag has leaked from the large hole in her mouth? Yes, that would be the source of the blood. When you performed this autopsy on February 3rd at 1139, you indicated that there was someone present from the Kootenai County Sheriff's Office. Do you recall that? There would be a written record of who was in the observation room, correct? But you don't recall interacting with the Kootenai County Sheriff? Uh, I may have spoken to them uh, before and after, but not actually during the process of the performing the autopsy. And that person wasn't one of the lead detectives, was it? I don't, I don't recall. And the purpose of that person being there was simply to collect items of evidentiary value that you may locate during the autopsy, such as the bullet. That's certainly one of their roles, and uh, I believe the uh, we have a, a medical examiner record to indicate uh, the transfer of the items collected at autopsy to the officer. Now, if you recall, the Spokane County Medical Examiner's Office got a new building right around this time. Do you recall that? Uh, prior to the autopsy. Okay, that was going to be my next question. Was this facility, was this autopsy performed in your new facility? Yes. And so, in this new facility, isn't it correct that law enforcement would not actually interact with you during the autopsy? They would be in a separate observation room, correct? Well, they had the option of uh, communicating through intercom, but they would not be at the autopsy table. You indicated with Mr. Johnson that you performed this autopsy with a couple of assistants, correct? Yes. And either you or your assistants had a camera to take photographs, correct? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Sure. Either you or your assistants had a camera to take photographs. Digital camera, correct. And typically, since you were the one doing the autopsy, it would be your assistants who would take photographs? Yes. But they would take Alice says, I want to close my ears and eyes for this cross. It's going to be Aina. That in, that's what we say in South Africa. It's going to be Aina. <laughs> Which just means it's going to be like hectic, like painful, like ooh. <laughs> and it, it is. It's already quite intense, right? Photographs at your direction, correct? Correct. We would have uh, 
standard protocols and then I would point out things that I requested uh, in addition or I would take photographs myself. So there were in fact standard protocols for the photographs that you would take, correct? Yes, the, it's posted, in, at least at the time, it was posted in the autopsy suite. And so standard procedure would probably include taking photographs of both sides of the body, correct? Yes. You began your autopsy with a, an overall review of the body, correct? Yes. But before you do that, isn't the body washed in preparation or at least clean to some degree prior to you beginning? No. Okay. Do you perform any kind of cleaning or washing during the process? Yes. Um, do you photograph the body after washing or cleaning? Yes. In your report, um, as you were documenting that external review, you noted that there was lividity present, correct? Yes. You indicated that lividity was faint, correct? Was what? Faint is the word that you used. Uh, if I could re Would looking at your report refresh your recollection? May I, Your Honor? Yes. And may I direct the witness so we can find a little yes. faster? Dr. Howard, I'm directing you to page three, the last paragraph. Yes. So on page three of the autopsy report, at the it's the last paragraph under the heading of main heading Dr. of extra. Howard, I'm going to ask you not testify from your report. Um, you can use it to refresh your Judge, I thought that's what counsel just asked me to do. Refresh my recollection is you can look at your report and if it refreshes your memory, then then you can answer the question from the memory. If that makes sense. All right. If I understand your question is that I describe it as faint. Yes. The answer is yes. You indicated that it was also primarily located on the posterior regions of the body, correct? Yes, that's correct. Um, and that, for, for those of us lay people, that would be the back side, correct? Correct. And again, were you aware at that time that Kendi Howard had been located lying on her back? Well, she was on her back at autopsy and had been transported on her back from the scene to the medical examiner's office. You um, unzipped the body bag as you previously indicated, and when you did so, you noted that Kendi Howard's hands were had been bagged to preserve evidence. I believe so, yes. At that time, you removed those bags and immediately examined her hands. Do you recall that? Yes. Um, you noted that there was no soot on her hands. Do you Correct. recall that? Yes. You then make an external um, examination of the body. Correct? Yes. You noted um, two specific areas of skin slippage. Do you recall that? Yes. Those would be on the right forearm and the heel of the left foot. Correct? That's correct. You then noted um, a series of um, contusions to the body. Do you recall that? I do. Now, a contusion would also be called a bruise, right? That's correct. Um, a bruise is the result of blunt force trauma, correct? Blunt force injury causing a blood vessel to break and hemorrhage in the surrounding tissue so that there's a discoloration that can be seen, a bruise, more medical term, contusion. Now, you would agree that a bruise is something that is sustained during life, correct? Yes. And as opposed to lividity, which shows up after death. Correct. And you would also agree that a bruise can be sustained in life, but show up after death, correct? It can. Uh, certainly, the hemorrhage under gravity, or as it spreads even after death, may become closer to the surface and there be more visible. You would agree that it is even at times a tool of pathologists to take a body and cool it and look at it later to see the bruises more clearly? That's possible, yes. Have you done that in your, in your own cases? Uh, occasionally, particularly in uh, suspected child abuse cases. Now, in your documentation of the contusions to Kenny Howard's body, you noted a four centimeter contusion to her right breast, correct? Yes. You noted 10 contusions to the right arm and the right elbow area, ranging in size from a centimeter to five centimeters. Correct. 
you noted 12 contusions on the right thigh, ranging from half a centimeter to 11 centimeters. Yes. You noted a contusion on the anterior aspect of the left arm that was about half a centimeter in size, correct? Correct. You noted two contusions on her left forearm near the elbow, approximately, again, half a centimeter to a centimeter and a half, correct? Yes. You noted five contusions to the left thigh, and again, these were approximately half a centimeter to four and a half centimeters in size, correct? Yes. You noted in your description of the damage to the head, contusions to the upper lip extending from one centimeter to the right of midline to two and a half centimeters to the left of midline, correct? Yes. You noted no fouling on the outer surfaces of the lips or the skin, correct? Correct. In fact, the only fouling that was present was located on the tongue inside the mouth, correct? That's correct. In fact, the only soot that you noted was located on the tongue inside the mouth, correct? Correct. You concluded, based on that, that the gun had been placed inside the mouth, correct? At the time of discharge, correct. You noted that there was no damage to the upper or lower teeth in the mouth, correct? I did not find it, that's correct. You noted that there was no blood in her lungs, correct? Correct. You noted that there was no blood in her stomach, correct? Correct. And you noted that there were no substances in her system other than caffeine, correct? That's what the toxicology results were. Now, Dr. Howard, um, Mr. Johnson asked you some questions about the tongue and about it being a muscle, right? Do you remember that? Yes. Um, would you agree that the tongue is a pretty um, important muscle in the mouth? Oh, certainly. We use it to talk, right, to eat, to swallow? Correct. Um, and would you agree that because of the, the importance of the tongue in the mouth, that there's quite a bit of blood vessels that flow into the tongue? Yes. Um, would you agree that the tongue is a very vascular muscle? It is. Would you agree that in your review of the tongue, that the bullet perforated the tongue? That's correct. Would you agree that the wound path of the tongue started at the tip and traveled through the tongue itself to the back of the tongue? Well, the bullet passed from the near the front of it, not necessarily the exact tip, but from the front towards the back, correct. And you would agree um, that in passing through the tongue, it severed multiple arteries or veins? Yes. You would agree that if multiple arteries or veins were severed, that that would result in bleeding? Yes. You would agree that if there is blood in the mouth, that that blood can only go to a couple of different places? There are several places to go, yes. Well, it could go to the stomach, correct? If the person is able to swallow, meaning they have to be alive in order to do that. It could go to the lungs, correct? If a person was still able to breathe after wounding, that can happen, yes. Or it would go out into the environment. It could, yes. Travel out through the mouth, travel out through the nose. Correct. Isn't it true that in your review of that wound pattern, you determined that it was at a downward or horizontal trajectory? No. You can't have downward and horizontal at the same time. I recorded front to back. Well, you utilized something called trajectory rods in this case, correct? Yes. And did you make a determination as to the trajectory of the bullet as to whether or not it was Downward, horizontal, or upward? I recorded front to back as the direction of fire. Dr. Howard, you are aware. He's getting a little snarky now, a little agitated. Aware of which cervical vertebrae the bullet ended up in? Yes. 
and you had the opportunity to review the loadouts or the x-rays that were taken. Yes. Would you to approach Madam Clerk? Good. Dr. Howard, I'm going to show you what's already been entered into evidence is States 20 L. Give me just a minute to get the technology to cooperate with my Do you recognize Thank you, Pernil. True, true. Please, everyone, refrain from diagnosing the witnesses on the stand. I see there's a lot of armchair diagnosing going on. We don't do that with witnesses, you know. We don't armchair diagnose in general, but like saying exactly what this guy's medical condition could be or mental health or anything. No, no, you know. May I, Your Honor? Yes, Mr. <clears throat> this appears to be a radiographic image uh, that are called taken as a part of the overall x-ray scans of the body uh, as a part of the overall post-arm examination. So if you would just kind of point out where the... So it's a, a side view of the, the head, the, the face, the front here. You can see she had a, uh, a basal post. She had a tooth implant. Uh, and Dr. Howard, I'm going to ask to see, just kind of to direct you a little bit. So this is a, a, a side view of Kendi Howard's head, correct? Right, top of the head here, neck here, the body here. Right. As I'm indicating on the screen. And so this is an x-ray of the body that you examined, correct? Correct. And you have just testified that the bullet traveled from essentially the front of her tongue, through the tongue, and ended in the C2 vertebrae, correct? Correct. The, the mouth is here, upper teeth, lower teeth. The tongue is you know, positioned in the lower portion. So from here to there. The bullet fragment, so the bullet doesn't go in an exact single line because it's fragmenting going but the main portion of the bullet is here these are smaller fragments showing up radi radiographically and the damage is i found both by radiographic and direct examination of the spine the damage to the spinal cord mostly is at c2 meaning the first cervical vertebra second and then down Okay. So, Dr. Howard, you would agree that that bullet did not travel in an upward trajectory? Correct. You would agree that it traveled in either a horizontal or downward trajectory? No. You're saying horizontal. It all depends on if you're talking about relative to the head or relative to the three dimensions of the room. The body could be in any position. So, if you say horizontal, I said front to back because... Dr. I'm just going to pause there for a second. The The silver lining, at least, is that in his short timer syndrome phase of his career, when he was just like ready to retire, right? Which I know many people can understand. You were saying in chat, you understand how you would have felt. However, you still got to do your job properly. Otherwise, imagine if the other medical examiners didn't, you know, continue and the investigators didn't continue their work on this case, well, then Daniel Howard would have been a free man. I mean, it took two years to arrest him, right? Sometimes these investigations take long. But at least he ruled her manner of death undetermined rather than saying that she took her own life. <laughs> at least that's the silver lining. At least he did that, right? And then saved her tongue, saved all the files and everything, and other medical examiners took over from there. Thank goodness. Dr. Howard, my question to you, though, is bullets can travel up, they can travel down, and they can travel straight. Do you agree with that? They can go in a variety of directions, correct. This bullet did not travel up, correct? Relative to your head, no. The bullet path was front to back. Yes. At the angle that you've just illustrated on this. Yes, X and uh, as you indicated, uh, as a part of the examination, uh, stainless steel probe. Uh, once the internal direction was established by my examination, I put the probe in to uh, show the line of the path of the bullet, and you have to align the barrel of the weapon with the path Dr. of the Howard, bullet. Dr. Howard, I'm going to ask you and to sit down. I, I did what I did. I'm going to ask you to sit down. Dr. Howard. Shay, <laughs> the way he scurries off. I'm going to ask you to sit down. He's like, okay, okay. Okay, I'm sitting. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Joanne. Really appreciate it. Uh, forensic Fear says, great point to you. Yes, right? Rather undetermined than anything else. 
I mean, homicide would have been great. But if he didn't, if he really thought he's, it's undetermined, okay. And then he retired. And then other medical examiners looked into it. All right, so. Mr. Johnson asked you some questions about petechia. You recall that line of questioning? Yes. And you explained that petechial hemorrhage occurs when pressure builds up in the capillaries. Well, or small venules, correct. And you testified that that was when there is occlusion of major arteries. No. You testified it was a partial occlusion, correct? Occlusion of the veins preventing blood returning back. There's still arterial pressure to the head to cause the vessels to engorge and for some of them to rupture. Would you not agree that if there is total, total occlusion, the petechia may not form? Correct. Would you agree that there are cases of strangulations or suffocations or asphyxiations where there is no petechia he hemorrhage present? Yes. Would you agree that in cases of strangulation, suffocation, or asphyxiation, breakage of the hyoid bone is not required to show those as the cause of death? Correct. Dr. Howard, are you familiar with literature, medical literature, regarding trajectory of bullet paths? Yes. Are you familiar with medical literature that indicates that a horizontal or downward trajectory is rare in suicides? Suicide, that has been studied. There are people who shoot themselves from in the top of the head downward. So it's not the most common, but they uh, can occur in a wide variety. To say that it's rare, it's certainly not the most common. <coughs> now, Dr. Howard, you cut out Kendi Howard's tongue, correct? It was... Using a scalpel, yes. It was removed from the body, dissected. In your many years of being a forensic pathologist, um, is the tongue a standard muscle that is removed from the body for dissection? I would say if, if it's a properly performed full forensic autopsy, yes. So in every autopsy you perform, you remove the tongue? except in cases where there wasn't one. And then you save it? Not necessarily. If there's no abnormality, maybe a, a section of it. Well, you saved it in this case, didn't you? Yes. Why? Because there was a gunshot wound at the time, and it would be common and uh, recommended practice to preserve that evidence. So you found that the tongue showed potential evidence. Yes, just as bits of the spinal cord that was transected were saved. Now, doesn't the lab have a standard list of what is kept in every case, correct? Uh, I don't recall doing that. I mean, we had a, a routine that each pathologist followed uh, of sampling major organs and structures, not necessarily a specific list. And, and those things that were kept, they were representative samples, very small amounts, correct? It varies, depending on, on the case. Surely the Spokane Medical Examiner's Office isn't keeping a hundred tongues in the back, right? I bet they are. They're keeping a tongue from every audience? A sample of them. A sample, not the entire tongue? Not necessarily, no. Dr. Howard, you indicated that in photographing the body, there would be standard procedures that you would follow for that documentation. Do you recall saying that? Yes. And the purpose of that documentation is to make an accurate record of what you're doing, correct? That's what's attempted to do, correct. And you indicated that you photograph areas that you document in your report. Well, we photograph the whole exterior of the body, and then if there's a particular area of a concern or an injury or developmental abnormality that we want to document or say natural disease, additional photographs may be taken in those to depict those specific areas, correct? But Dr. Howard, you did not photograph Kenny Howard's back without blood on it. I don't recall. It, uh, it would be I would apologize, it would be remiss if we didn't, but uh, it's often difficult to get the body cleaned and bled. Uh, 
Can't say. Well, the council recall. showed you a very bloody photo of the body being immediately removed from the from the body bag. Do you recall yes. that picture? Yes. Would it surprise you that that is the only photograph of Kendi Howard's back? That's not true. There are photographs in the back of the neck, and which you depict the whole body. I don't recall. Dr. Howard, you noted in your report, as we previously discussed, twelve purple contusions to the back of the right thigh. You recall that? That's what I recall. Yes. Would it? surprise you that there's no photograph of that? I don't recall. Dr. Howard, as we discussed, you noted two contusions on the proximal and ulnar aspect of the left forearm near the elbow. Do you recall that? Yes. Would it surprise you that you took no photos of that part of the left arm? I don't recall. Dr. Howard, you indicated five areas of contusions on the medial aspect of the left thigh. Do you recall that? Yes. Would it surprise you to know that there are no specific photos of that area, though it can somewhat be seen in other larger photos based on body position? I don't recall that. Maybe. Would it not have been standard procedure to take photographs of contusions that you noted in your report? Yes, it would have been. And in fact, some of the photos that you did take, you actually utilized a ruler to show the size of the contusions. Yes. But you didn't do that in every case, did you? No, uh, I may have directed it. Uh, obviously, if they aren't there, that wasn't done. Dr. Howard, you indicated um, skin slippage in two specific places. Do you recall that testimony? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? You noted skin slippage in two specific areas. Skin slippage, yes. One of those areas was on the arm. Do you recall that? Yes. I'm going to show you, Dr. Howard, what's already in evidence as states 20R. Dr. Howard, you took this photograph. Do you recall that? Well, the photograph was taken during the course of the autopsy, correct. You utilized a ruler in this portion, you recall that? Yes. Dr. Howard, is this the area that you were calling skin slippage? Yes, uh, if I may. So the intact skin, so here you see it's very moist, typical of being having been in water, and where the areas of discoloration here are where the post-mortem decay of the body, which naturally occurs, has rest in these particular locations, typical of having some perhaps some pressure in that area, in addition to the normal decay and the addition of being immersed in water, the layers of the skin start to separate. So the very surface layers have started to come off, there's it slips, and the deeper layers are now exposed and visible. Dr. Howard, you can have a seat. <coughs> Dr. Howard, um, were you provided any other opinions about this particular injury prior to your testimony today? I believe defense counsel uh, mentioned someone referring to them as burns. Would, were you informed that a burn doctor from Harperview Medical Center calls this a second degree burn? Well, second degree burn is My the... My question, Dr. Howard, was were you informed? I did not know that a, uh, such a doctor said that statement. And were you also informed that Dr. Jennifer Nara, who you used to work with, as well as Dr. Bill Smock, agree with that assessment? Uh, no, I'm not. And, Doctor, you indicated that skin slippage is caused by pressure and can be exacerbated by being in the water. Did I understand that correctly? Well, and it, could, it occurs as a post-mortem decay of the body. But this was the only place on the body that this is observable, correct? No. This is the only place on the body that this pattern of what you're calling skin slippage is observable on the body, correct? No. Okay. You are referring to what you call... It's so weird. Whenever he says no, he nods. No, which is normally, no, no. <laughs> the behavior panel will teach us, like... No, <laughs> it's almost like yes. Um, 
odd that he called a second degree burn, skin slippage, right? Called oh, skin slippage on the left heel? Yes. Okay, let's look at the left heel then. And Dr. Howard, you're gonna have to give me a second because I don't think you photographed that. Dr. Howard, do you recall taking a photograph of this, what you call skin slippage on the left foot? I don't recall. Do you recall whether or not what you observed on the left foot looked significantly different from the right foot? As I recall, I observed the skin slippage on the left heel, uh, not on the right. Dr. Howard, I'm going to approach you with what I'm going to call Exhibit 26. And then within that picture, there's 26E zoom and 20, it's 26C zoom. All right. Yes. Now, certainly this is something that you did not create, correct? You mean this particular document? I did not. Um, however, um, do you, and it may be difficult, but do you recognize that these would have... <laughs> the elbow is out as well. Listen here, Dr. Howard. <laughs> We're about to grill you. Well, he's been grilled for a while here now. Like, listen, okay. Been photographs taken at autopsy. Yes. Um, and these were been taken from Kendi Howard's autopsy, correct? Uh, it's consistent with that, but I can't document that. Um, move to admit what I'm going to call states 26. No objection. 26 is Dr. Howard. As you noted, this was not something that was created by you, correct? Oops. Well, the image, the two, there are two images. Uh, they may have been photographs taken under my direction, but I did not create this particular document. Correct. And these are zooms of photographs that you, that were taken at autopsy, correct? As I say, I, I, they are consistent with that, yes. And so, on the left foot here, you indicate that there is skin slippage on that left foot, correct? I said left heel. Left heel, okay, left heel, correct? Yes. Okay, and there is, according to your report, not skin slippage on the right heel, correct? Correct. Um, and you would agree that what you're terming skin slippage on the left foot has a different pattern than what is observed on the forearm. Yes. You did not, at the time of autopsy, take any representative samples of that, what you term skin slippage, on the arm. Correct? No, I did not. You did not cut into it or biopsy it in any way, correct? No. You did not also, in your examination of the feet, note any lacerations to the feet or toes, correct? Correct. You did not note any blunt force trauma to the head, correct? Blunt force, no. You did not note um, additional contusions to the body other than the ones that we just talked about, correct? Correct. You did not note any additional abrasions or lacerations to the thumb or hands, correct? Correct. You did not um, note any uh, swelling around the fracture of the mandible, correct? I don't recall. Uh, that was not a specific... Why? That's what I'm saying here. <laughs> if you see, I've got no sound. I'm just like, why? Why is he not taking note of that? Well, we know, but he wasn't very observant, right? Term I used in the report, correct. At the time, uh, prior to your testimony here today, um, were you made aware that uh, Dr. Jennifer Nara also reviewed um, the Tom? That's my understanding. That, that, that was shared with you. What's that? That information was shared with you by defense counsel? Also, for people that are saying, you know, not that we do say such things here, but that, you know, that the state's, uh, the prosecutor's voice is a little bit loud today i think she, it has to be because um this witness seems to be hard of hearing you know so she's like making sure that he can, <laughs> she's grilling and making sure that he can hear all the questions right uh i was gonna say something else but it'll come back to me oh yeah yeah dr jennifer nara what a brilliant witness that that was as well 
which I can't remember exactly which day, but it's all timestamped for you. It was day two or three, I think it was, because she was witness number, pop quiz. <laughs> what witness number was she? 15. Okay, she was witness number 15. Uh, so just find that, because her testimony, if you missed it, was really good. I believe that someone had examined the tongue. I don't recall her name being used specifically. And you do know Dr. Jennifer Nara, correct? Yes, I do. She worked with you at Spokane County Medical Examiner's Office? Yes. A competent pathologist? I think so, yes. Are you aware that Dr. Nara um, found that um, the, the bullet, um, as, as did you, found that the bullet traveled through the top? I don't recall that being specifically, but I'm assuming that's what she, if she examined the tongue, she would find out. Were you made aware that when she examined the tongue under the microscope, she observed significantly less hemorrhage than she would have expected to see? Uh, that specific, I, I was not made aware that uh, of that in terms, I believe it's just says less than she expected, but I didn't know it was based on her microscopic exam. Time of your autopsy at 11:30 on February 3rd, um, you indicated with Mr. Johnson that the information that you had was based on information the coroner had entered into their system. The coroner entered some basic uh, identity, uh, yes, and an initial uh, scene investigation information usually. And that did not include photographs of the scene, correct? Not, to, not that I observed, no. And you had not had the opportunity to speak with any of the lead investigators at that time, correct? Not that I recall. And you had not spoken directly to Chief Deputy Lynn Acevedo, Chief Deputy Coroner Lynn Acevedo, correct? Not, not that I recall. Just had those notes, correct? What, whatever was entered into the uh, computer system, correct. And you were made aware by defense counsel that um, there was further documentation of the body that was done later by the coroner, correct? Yes. The Spokane County Medical Examiner does not rule on manner of death in Kootenai cases, correct? Correct. It's a coroner case, not a medical examiner case. And it's not a Spokane County Medical Examiner's job to go to the scene, correct? Not outside the Spokane County, correct. You, you don't go to scenes in Kootenai County, correct? Correct. And, and thus, you did not do that in this case, correct? I did not. You stated, in your opinion, the autopsy findings indicated the muzzle of the weapon was inside the mouth when it was discharged, correct? Yes. And you based that on the foul link to the tongue, correct? The <laughs> nature of the wound, the fact that there's bruising of the lips, and the fracture of the, of the mandible, those are typical and common of an intraoral gunshot wound, along with the presence of the gunshot residue, which would be visible as fouling, correct? Oh, man. We heard other experts say very different things, that Kendi's broken jaw and the swelling around it could not have occurred after death or from that injury. It would have been before, right? Never mind all the other 30 injuries, the second degree burn and all of that. <laughs> like, okay, I can see why he retired. He retired a few months after performing this autopsy. So in 2021. On the tongue, correct? Yes. And there was soot on the tongue, correct? Yes. You examined this body and you saw a wound in Candy Howard's mouth, correct? Yes. Had Kendi Howard been alive when she sustained that gunshot wound, without medical intervention, that wound would have killed her, correct? Yes. The wound in Kendi Howard's mouth, if she had been alive at the time that she was shot, would have been a cause of death. Well, it's not just the mouth. The spinal cord injury uh, was the primary reason she would die. She would, because of the damage. Was, Dr. Howard. He was answering. Overall. My question, Dr. Howard, was if she had been alive 
and she sustained that shot, that would have been her cause of death. Yes. Based on the observations that you made of the body, you did not consider other possibilities, correct? Not true. All types of death, all causes of death are considered in every case. You look for evidence for that. The evidence that you saw at that time led you to the gunshot wound, correct? There is absolute positive evidence of a gunshot wound with the same amount of hemorrhage and bleeding that I've seen in hundreds of other gunshot wounds that prove fatal. So yes, the I determined that this gun, in the absence of evidence of any other cause of death, was the cause of death in this case. In the absence of evidence of other causes, is that something that you would consider? Every time. And so there have been cases in your thousands of cases in your career where other evidence has led to a change in your determination. Well, manner of death is, is commonly challenged and additional information comes up, but in terms of cause of death, uh, certainly we, for example, we, we do all have any drug overdoses, you wait for the toxicology, not just the anatomy. So there's no amount of information that could have been provided to you that would have changed your opinion as to cause of death? As I said, this has the same occurrence of literally hundreds and hundreds of gunshot wounds that prove fatal in other cases that I've performed the autopsy. There's no reason for me to believe that there is any other cause of death. Well, did Mr. Johnson provide you with the complete two-year investigation for your consideration? The what? The complete two-year police investigation. No. Did he provide you with Dr. Nara's reports or opinions? No. Did he provide you with Dr. Smoth's reports or opinions? No. Did he provide you with Dr. Stewart's reports or opinions? No. Is it your job as a forensic medical examiner to determine whether a crime scene has been staged? Well, I certainly uh, have always been available to assist in that. I mean, the whole point is, uh, if it's a medical examiner case where I'm responsible for... In a coroner for the, case, like in Kootenai County, would it be your job to determine whether a crime scene was staged? No. Nothing further. And you, Mr. Director? Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> Doctor, counsel just asked you about a staged crime scene. That would relate to the manner of death, is that right? Correct. Okay. Now, when you and I... Uh, had a conversation regarding Exhibit 20R. Um, I was asking you, what was I asking you to compare? Uh, th that's the area of the forearm showing skin slippage. And that, you put skin slippage in your report, correct? Yes. And I asked you if that was a burn or a, did I ask you if it was a burn or a skin slippage? Yes. Did you explain to me why you thought, thought it was skin slippage? Yes. Okay. I didn't provide you any opinions as to uh, Dr. Ford's conclusions. I haven't received anyone else's report, correct. Now, counsel asked you uh, to begin with that uh, the examination starts after you wash the body and you said no. Do you remember that? Yes. Uh, why doesn't it? Because you want to see the body in its original condition. How much blood is there? Are there any trace pieces of trace evidence? You don't want to wash that off before you have a chance to identify it and collect it. Okay. Now, I did provide to you a copy of your autopsy photos, correct? Yes. Um, do you know how many photos you have? There were dozens. I don't. <laughs> I didn't count. Was it more or over a hundred, or more or less than a hundred? There were many. Okay. Now, counsel asked you about blunt force trauma. Um, can can a small impact leave blunt force trauma? Sure. Every every bruise is some form of 
no matter how small, is, is a blunt force injury. So blunt force trauma is a kind of a medical terminology? Yes, as opposed to a needle puncture or a gunshot wound or a sharp instrument stab wound or an abrasion where it's a scrape, it's just impact to that area. You, you bang your shin on a coffee table, that's blunt, blunt force impact. If you examined a, a body and noticed a bruise, would you ever put bruise in your report? I would, being a medical doctor uh, doing this, I use the term contusion, but they're interchangeable. So blunt force trauma and contusion are interchangeable? Well, blunt force trauma can cause other things like lacerations or fractures, but they produce, but a bruise is a form of blunt force injury. Now, uh, counsel asked you about um, uh, asphyxia in relationship to petechiae. You remember that? Yes. Okay. And uh, is, under what circumstances can you have asphyxia without petechiae? Oh, there are many. Uh, put a soft pillow and smother someone. That's occluding their airway and they can't breathe. It's not a, impairing the blood flow until the heart stops. Uh, if you have an individual who is in a confined space like a uh, storm sewer that has low oxygen, if there isn't fresh air pumped in, they can asphyxiate from lack of oxygen. There's no compromise to the blood vessels, no particular. Just two of many examples. Can a person be strangled without petechiae? It's theoretically possible. There are very rare cases that have been reported in the literature, yes. I'm just going to pause for a second there. I'm just looking into some of these like botched autopsies that he may have performed because they mentioned it before in the trial that it could have been 14 of them that he got investigated for. And so they say in one case, in 2012, there was the death of a lady called Carla Williams. And this doctor determined that Williams' cause of death was undetermined despite court records indicating that she had defensive wounds and was cut in half. <laughs> like, oh my goodness. So there's a whole bunch of disputes that went on and investigations. I'll look a little more into this. Okay. We did hear quite a bit about it during the trial, but wow. Um, it was also the pandemic at the time when he performed this autopsy. So I don't know if that added to him, you know, really wanting to retire. Just like, ugh, he's done with his job, but still, I don't think the complacency was okay. At least he said undetermined, but still, I don't think it was okay. Because, thank goodness, the police were still investigating and more medical examiners looked at it. You know. Wow. Council asked you about the skin slippage on on the right arm. Yes. Um, Doctor, I'm showing you what's been admitted as 17A Zoom. Can you just take a moment and look at that? Yes. All right. Okay. Now, does the way the count, uh, I think in one of your answers involving skin slippage, does the length of time of persons submerged in water affect skin slippage. Objection beyond the scope. Overruled. Yes. And pressure uh, affect, I think you, did you say pressure? That's pressure. one of the factors that can uh, accelerate the decay process. In anything, so I did provide you copies of the coroner's photos, correct? <clears throat> yes, there were uh, the ones that were that appeared to me to be taken uh, after the body got to a funeral home. The uh, postmortem changes in the autopsy had been undone, and the body had been uh, dealt with by some member of their staff. I'm not going to ask you about those photos, other than did anything in those photos? Objection beyond the scope. Overruled. It's fairly correct. Did anything in those photos change your opinion as to cause of death? No. 
the cause of death is gunshot wound? That's my opinion. No further questions. Permission to approach the clerk? Okay. <laughs> Danny Dawn, question. You said, I don't know, guys. I have a bad feeling he won't be found guilty. I mean, we don't know. We don't have a crystal ball, right? And the defense will continue on Monday with the, I think, their final witness because if we count, it should be their final witness. And then it'll be closing arguments and all that, right? But my question would be, did you watch the whole trial? Because, damn, I've never seen a state present a case this well. It was so good. And I just, I think that they really proved their case. You know, of course, now when it's the defense's turn to present witnesses, it could make people think differently, but it doesn't to me. If we remember all the things that Dr. Jennifer Nora said, Dr. Smock, and all the evidence we've seen, I don't know. I don't think that this is holding all that much weight. Sorry for the screen now. We I paused in the fade out. <laughs> Let's go forward. There we go. Okay. Schedule. Uh, Mr. Johnson anticipates wrapping up with factual witnesses uh, somewhat um, today. He has an expert witness who's from um, who's traveling here and will be here Monday and cannot be here tomorrow. Um, what that means is rather than bringing back for you know, an hour or two of testimony tomorrow, uh, we're just going to call it a day off. And I want to let you know so that if you want to make other plans or something, um, it looks like we'll finish out today, be off Friday. Of course, this was yesterday, remember? Remember, we are doing a one-day delay coverage. But don't you think that's so sweet of the judge <laughs> to tell the jury, okay, just for planning, you know, we, we're going to finish today, which was yesterday, and then Friday would be a day off for them. He's like, maybe you want to make some plans. And he tells him that before the long lunch break and everything, so that in case they maybe want to, I don't know, call a friend or say, hey, do you want to do something tomorrow? Because they're not going to have to be in the courtroom. So that's why you might not see a live court feed today. <laughs> well, you won't see a live court feed today. There's no court for this case today. And they continue again on Monday. Okay. Friday and back Monday. I want to let you know as soon as I, as soon as I do that and just with the way things are going to be, it looks like that's going to be the case. So I'm just going to go ahead and make the executive call now that we'll, uh, we'll end today, take Friday off, and be back on Monday. So, um, I'm sorry for any inconvenience, but it's just the reality of what happens. Okay, I wanted you to know that before the end of the day, so if you needed to make plans for your kids. Okay, we will recess for the lunch hour. I'll see you back at 1.30. Did you enjoy that? <laughs> Very close. <laughs> the camera person was like, look at him. Look at <laughs> this is the defendant. Look at his ear, right? Look at it. <laughs> okay, continuing. I did want to just make a quick record. As, as was pointed out yesterday, uh, we've had frequent bench uh, conferences for the 2000 disaster approach. And I've, I've always indicated to him at our conferences, uh, if you wish to make a record to preserve it for appeal, I'd be happy to do so at any break. A few times you have, Mr. Johnson. Uh, most of the times you have. Today, I think, was one of the few times I've actually called you all up. And so I wanted to just make a record of what that conference was. Um, Mr. Johnson was asking the witness, he, he was in the middle of a question that I didn't know the end of it, which is why I called him up here rather than have that in front of the jury. Um, and Mr. Johnson, as I recall, you were wanting to ask, uh, Dr. Howard, if the amount of blood seen was consistent with other cases of intraoral gunshot wounds, the state objected that that was beyond uh, the scope of his report. I indicated at the at our bench conference that uh, I did think that that was beyond the scope to ask him to compare it to other cases, but it was a fair question as to was the amount of blood consistent with the gunshot that we saw, the one we saw here. And so that was your question uh, to the witness. So to the extent I limited your question of the witness, I wanted to make that record. Uh, however, I'll just note it ultimately didn't matter because that was brought out on cross-examination. So, but I just wanted to make the record uh, clear what the argument was. 
Okay, we'll be in recess till. Oh, yes, sorry. Can I just, um, Mr. Johnson indicated in chambers that the some witnesses that he had requested be under um, recall that he is releasing. We can just put that on the record so those witnesses could be available. The only one uh, that would be uh, subject to recall will be the next witness, Detective Lawton. Everyone else will be released. Okay. So any other witnesses from the state that have demanded are released and not to be called by the defense? Sure. Okay. Thank you. All right. We'll be in recess. All right. Are we ready? For are we ready? Are we ready to teleport? <laughs> are we buckled up? Okay, we, now we one hour 45 into our trial footage uh, for today, which is three hours 35 long. It's not long today, huh? There was a lot of fluff on this day. Oh my goodness. Detective North Pedroza, if Mr. Howard were to testify, he was looking to recall if Mr. Howard testifies. Judge, I don't think that record was made at the time. He was, he was never asked to be something. Andrew, thank you for being here. You said you bummed you, that you missed some of the state's questions with Dr. Howard. At least you can always watch the replay, right? I'll make sure to timestamp everything after this day as well, as I have with all the other days. But thank you to all of you who pop in and out, even if you can't be here with us throughout the day. I really appreciate it. And for those of you who take us with you, huh? when you're going out to, I don't know, feed animals, some people have a farm or something, or you're going to the doctor or whatever. <laughs> thank you for taking us with you, okay? Uh, Your Honor, we do have a, we do have a motion. You may see What is your motion, Mr. Your Honor, we would uh, renew our motion from yesterday uh, for a uh, direct verdict as to count one. Uh, it is clear from the evidence that the blood that's in the body bag could have come from no nowhere else than from the uh, injuries sustained by gunshot. There were no other internal injuries to cause the bleeding. The vast amount of blood, coupled with the blood in the tub, coupled with the coagulated blood in the tub, uh, eliminates the state's theory. This only evidence. No, no, <laughs> no, no, Jason. I don't think so. He's just stating things as facts, just based on what he knows from his curious questions. A directed verdict is a ruling entered by a trial judge after determining that there is no legally sufficient evidentiary basis for a reasonable jury to reach a different conclusion. That's the motion that he's now, you know, presenting <laughs> in this break outside of the presence of the jury. Like basically saying they don't even need to go on verdict watch. They don't need to, de de well, they don't need to deliberate. They could literally just, we could just call it a day here. <laughs> no, no, I don't think so. But I mean, he has to try. Of strangulation is a quote unquote lack of blood. Not one, uh, not one explanation has been presented to the blood in the body bag other than the internal injury sustained by the gunshot. Um, certainly this is not related to uh, count two, or count, I'm sorry, I'm referring to count two. This is not related to count one, uh, so we would uh, renew our motion from yesterday. Any response? Let me inquire first, Your Honor. Rule 29 specifically states, or at least it begins with, after the prosecution closes its evidence or after the close of all the evidence. So I'd like to inquire if the defense is resting, because if they're not, this motion is untimely, premature. Well, the state has closed, uh, so I, our interpretation is that it's still within that, that purview. Uh, so we're definitely not closing at the, or resting at this point, but I think in light of the evidence that is in front of the court, we renew our motion for yesterday. Well, I'll, I'll put aside the procedural question for the moment and hear any response from <laughs> I really like this judge. He's very professional, right? I don't know how to say his surname out loud. I know how to spell it. Is it like, <laughs> should I try? It's like Beric. Lamont is his first name. Lamont, Judge Lamont Berries. It's B-E-R-E-C-Z. Berez, Lamont. <laughs> Very nice judge. Your Honor, thank you. Your Honor, I don't think Rule 29 is meant to take into consideration the defense's case. I think 29 is meant to take into consideration whether or not the state 
has put on sufficient evidence to sustain a conviction. Nothing has changed between yesterday and today when we're arguing this. So I would rest on yesterday's arguments, Your Honor. Thank you. I'm going to deny the Rule 29, <clears throat> setting aside whether it's procedurally proper to raise it again at this time. Um, I, I think viewed as a whole, a reasonable juror can find the defendant guilty beyond reasonable doubt. Um, the only thing that's changed since yesterday. Ah, he said it again. <laughs> he said it right. Am I hearing it right? Every time he said that, I'm like, what? Did he just say that? Like, the, a jury could find easily, I don't know how he worded it exactly, would find him guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Yeah, there's no reasonable doubt in this case, in my opinion, based on all the evidence we heard. <laughs> it sounds like in the judge's opinion, too. Uh, also, Melissa was asking how many more witnesses. Um, so if you're asking because you're thinking, should I go? Should I stay? Stay. <laughs> don't go. Uh, we've got three more witnesses for this day. And one of them is actually who you guys have been asking about a lot. When is Dan and Kendi Howard's son going to testify? Well, he's going to testify today at the end. Okay, so... But he's testifying for the defense, so just remember that. Today's motion is a testimony of Dr. Howard. Uh, a juror could, could disregard his testimony, or a juror could believe his testimony. Uh, but even. I, <clears throat> even as I listen to his testimony, he doesn't, at least in the court's view, uh, he doesn't necessarily contradict. Uh, the state's witnesses entirely. I'm sorry to interrupt him there. Jennifer D. There you go. You said it very nicely. There is sufficient evidence for a jury to find beyond a reasonable doubt. Yes, yes. That is the standard as to whether or not the case should go to the jury. Thank you so much. Remember, I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> so I really appreciate that. That's that's what I keep hearing. Like, oh, no, no, there's definitely sufficient evidence. Mm -hmm. Beyond a reasonable doubt, they could find him guilty. They could. Uh, also, I keep losing my train of thought today. Oh, yeah, yeah. His Stanley Cup. Where's his Stanley Cup now? <laughs> He's only got his water bottle today. All the other days he had his, his nice Stanley Cup there. As to the presence of the, the blood, he indicated the um, cross-examination, the only way that comes out is from the wounds. Uh, his opinion wasn't... Um, well, okay. Okay, so see, the, the jurors can draw their own conclusions, but I'm saying he, he did not definitively refute the state's case. Uh, and I, again, I viewed as a whole, I, I think a reasonable jurors could certainly find through the others on that. So, and, and, and again, this is, of course, in the light, we will say with the state as an operative party. So, I mean, deny the rules on that. Okay. Otherwise, we're ready to proceed. Yes, sir. Good. You can be seated. Thank you. <coughs> Continue on, Mr. Johnson. You follow your next witness. Your Honor, before we do that, we'd like to um, during the state's case in chief, we admitted into evidence Exhibit D. We'd like permission to publish. Agree? What was it? Our Exhibit D is messages between uh, defense portion of messages from uh, Ms. Howard and Tanner. And that exhibit was pretty safe in it? Yes, sir. Okay. <coughs> Sorry, I didn't even ask the state if you had any objections. I'm not even sure what we're looking at now. Can you actually ask for this? It's been a bit of, like, several days ago, now. It's exhibit, exhibit D. What? D. The messages from defense from. Do uh, you have a copy for the state? Is there a number that precedes D, counsel? No. It's a pendency to it. Do you have a copy or not? I don't have a copy. I'm going to do it. We give you copies of all of our exhibits. We give you a copy when you get into it. Can you make it to you? This is called Detective Lawton. Good afternoon, Detective. Good afternoon. Who is this witness? I know you just heard the name. Have we seen him before? <laughs> I have little live quizzes, okay? So this is, wasn't he? Yeah, he was the first witness in this case. Do you remember? Day one, first witness for the state, Kenneth Lollerton. Now, he, he's the one actually in my intro, you know, when he talks about Dan Howard rubbing his hands on his pants 
you know, to try to get rid of gunshot residue evidence, perhaps. Anyway, so he's back on the stand here. I don't think he's pleased to be back on the stand for the defense, but let's hear it. So now we are one hour 52 into our trial footage out of three hours 35. Can you please uh, state your name for the record? It's Ken Lallatin, L-A-L-L-A-T-I-N. I know you previously testified uh, before in this matter, uh, but can you uh, remind the jury how long you've been a detective? I was a detective from approximately 1999 until I think 2003 or 2004, and, and then I went into person's crimes in January of 2006 until I retired September of this last year. Would you, um, do you believe it's important to be objective as a detective? Absolutely. As a detective, you frequently come across uh, individuals who are experiencing uh, emotional trauma or hardships. All the time. Is it important to separate out the emotions from objective investigations? I would say so. When did you arrive on scene again uh, on um, the incident with Ms. Howard? I arrived the night of her death about, I believe, 15 minutes before midnight, give or take. Okay. You, uh, during that course um, of the investigation, did you take possession of Ms. Howard's phone? I did not personally, no. Did you, did you or someone you were with, um, while you were with them, go through her phone? Could you repeat the question? So there was a period of time where, uh, let me just back up a little bit. You arrived, did you arrive with other detectives? Yes, I was driving. Detective Sergeant Daryl Euler was riding with me. Jerry Northrup was already um, on scene, parked in front of the residence waiting for our arrival. Uh, and we've, the jury has seen uh, multiple videos uh, in this matter. Uh, during the course of those many hours before you cleared the scene, did you and Detective Euler uh, go out to your vehicle to discuss what you were observing? Yes. As part of that observation, uh, were either one of you uh, going through her phone? I don't recall ever going through her phone. Now, we heard a couple days ago um, your interactions with Mr. Howard around 6.45 in the morning. Was that on video? Well, our interaction was from around midnight until at least that time. So yes, there were multiple breaks in between. Okay. When um, Brooke called her dad or, or uh, Dan back. Did you form an opinion that Dan did it? No. Was I suspicious? 100%. Did that suspicion cloud your investigation in any way? Not at all. Okay. That day, did you conduct a phone interview with, with uh, Wendell and Janie Wilkins? No. On the third? No. Now, did you conduct an interview with Brooke on the 10th? I don't recall the dates. I spoke with Brooke, uh, I believe, two separate times. One was the morning of the incident, and later, um, I believe we met in person. There were a lot of interviews with this investigation. Okay. Um, just for anyone who's confused, like Pinche, Becky, Zero, oh, I was like reading out your full name here, Zero F's given, said, I thought the state rested. They did. They rested yesterday. This is the defense's case. And the defense is um, able to call the state's witnesses back to the stand to ask them more questions when they present their case. 
for the lawyers in chat. Am I saying that right? <laughs> really hope so. Um, but yeah, shame. Detective Lullerton does not look happy to be here for the defense here. He's just like, oh, answering his questions like, mm-hmm. Okay, so because this is a recalled witness, maybe there's going to be two witnesses on Monday based on how we're counting. There could be two, okay? We're just counting because they had nine on the list for the defense. So we'll see how many they have on Monday. And then that should be a wrap. Uh, Jason Johnson, the defense attorney, actually said Monday or Tuesday. So we'll see how it goes next week. Now, at the beginning of this case, were you the lead detective? No, I was not. But you became the lead detective? Yes. And when was that? Would have been July of the same year. So from July of the, that year till today, have you or any officers on your direction that you know of interviewed uh, Carrie Maitland? No, she's not one time ever came into the sheriff's office and contacted us. To make a statement. And that was the friend of Kendi's that spoke yesterday. If you missed that, you got to go check it out. Oh, man. Those friends, it's actually Dan's friends. One of Dan's best friends, Brett Gunderson, Gunderson, Gunderson testified, and his girlfriend. And sure, yeah, those, those stories they told were quite tall. In fact, I didn't even know, honestly, who she was until yesterday. Did... You or any other officers at your direction between the time you took over and today ever interview Brett Gunderson? No, same thing. Not one time did he ever make an effort that I'm aware of to come down to the sheriff's office or to call me. Do you ever interview Mr. Prado? Yes, I was with Detective Boiler um, when we contacted and interviewed Daniel Prado at his place of employment in Kamei, Idaho. During that interview, did you become aware of potential witnesses to an alleged event on July 10th of I, 2020? I don't recall. Had you become aware... Oh, I'll strike that. You conducted a second search warrant on the 17th? Detectives and officers from the Sheriff's Office and Idaho State Police uh, Forensic Unit served one, yes. And you were present? I'm going to slightly speed it up. Okay, it's just, it's a little bit slow, right? Slightly slow-ish. It's 1.1 now. Let's make it 1.2. Mrs. Melissa said, are we going to watch the closing together live? I hope so. <laughs> it's a little bit of an intuition game, a little bit of a guessing game. But I'm thinking of maybe doing some delayed coverage so that we can still skip over lunch break and coffee break. It won't be quite the deflat for you, the standard <laughs> that we used to now with a day delay. But we've done trials like that before. We cover it live on the day and then just start a bit later. Maybe we might do that if that's going to be on Monday. I really hope it will be. I was present for portions of that, but I was not directly involved, no. As lead detective from very early on in the case, are you familiar with all the uh, reports and uh, of other officers and reports of, for instance, what's in property? Uh, yes, so when I took over the investigation in July, um, I reviewed, to my knowledge, most all of the reports. They're fairly substantial. <laughs> on that second search warrant, was there a person there who was not law enforcement? At the time of serving the search warrant? Yeah, executing the search warrant, yes. At the residence? Yes. I guess I, I'm not understanding your question. We, we had personnel from Idaho State Police Forensic Unit there. But non-law enforcement. It was uh, Mr. Howard there, uh, John Howard. Oh, yes he was. The purpose of the second search warrant was to confirm some of what Dan had said that the jury heard in the audio, correct? Objection, Lee. Sustained. Was the purpose of the search warrant in part to confirm some of what Dan had said in your interview? Yes. Specifically, the search 
was to check for a bullet hole in the upstairs closet where Dan said a gunshot went off in the house in a prior event, correct? Yeah, or, again, sustained. Was one of the reasons to search for... Operative word Dan, where Dan said, Daniel Howard said that once upon a time, Kenny tried to take her own life by being in the closet or something and raising a gun to her head and then she shot through the floor and there was a bullet hole in the floor. But based on everything we've heard, I would speculate that could have even been from him. <laughs> of course, the defense attorney keeps bringing this up. Every spot in the upstairs closet where Dan had said a gunshot went off in a prior event. Yes. Did law enforcement find a gunshot, evidence of a gunshot in the spot where Dan had said? I know that Detective Northrup found a hole in the floor. I know that he tested it for copper and other things related to bullets and was unable to determine what actually caused the hole. The piece of carpet was removed. Was a piece of carpet removed and booked into property? Yes, I believe there was. At any point, have you reviewed? Uh, let me straight, Have you reviewed? Uh, what is in property? Uh, yeah, several times, multiple times. Are there any black pants anywhere in property? To the best of my knowledge, no. Are there any black hoodies anywhere in pro property? I don't believe so, no. Are there any black gloves anywhere in property? No. I have no further questions, John. Based on your common sense, could black hoodies, gloves, and... But would they be looking for that on that day? Also, where were they? Because we know on January 29th, it was said uh, that Dan Howard had towered over Kendi and was wearing like all black with black gloves on and all of that. So that sounded very scary. And then she went to stay with the parents for the weekend, came back, and that's when the alleged murder occurred. So where are those black gloves, huh? Probably got rid of them. Can be simply discarded by someone committing a crime? All the time. Especially someone who would be cognizant of what a crime was and how to get rid of evidence? Yes. And that could happen, especially true with someone who's trained in the collection of evidence, couldn't it? I would believe so. And Dan Howard was trained in that, wasn't he? Objection, foundation as to getting rid of evidence, Your Honor. He was. Dan Howard was a former Idaho State Trooper. Like, <laughs> you know, Idaho State Police Trooper. He had experience. Do you lay foundation for the house? Do you know Dan Howard? Yes, I do. I, I think we spoke about this when you first testified, didn't we? Yes, we did. And you've known him professionally for over 10 years, right? Probably closer to 15. Yes. You've been sitting here in the entire trial while people have discussed his law enforcement background, haven't you? Yes, I have. And you know as well as everybody else that he has a background in evidence collection, right? Yes. He has knowledge of DNA, right? Yes. Ballistics? Correct. And so it would follow then, because he has that knowledge, he would have the knowledge on how to get rid of all that evidence, wouldn't he? Yes, he would. <laughs> this detective always thought Dan Howard was sus. He's like, yes, he would. He would have that knowledge. Joy, you know that 5 and 55 and all that. Those are my favorite numbers. <laughs> so happy 55th birthday to you. And thank you for being here with us on your birthday. Oh, my goodness. Happy birthday. I hope you have a wonderful day. You were asked some questions about um, being objective in this case. You remember that? Yes, I do. Do you think you have been objective? Yes. Why do you say that? Well, if we would have just taken Dan's word or one other person's word, that's one thing. But in this particular case, we let the facts and the evidence lead to a truthful truthful conclusion in this investigation. Objection to the we went to the word truthful. Please continue, Detective. I, I would say this was one of the most intensive investigations I can recall being involved with. It, it took a team of investigators. Not only was I involved in this case, but we had experienced investigators from multiple agencies, and we elicited the assistance from some of the top 
um, experts in their fields that are unbiased. Objection un Foundation for Technology Expert Journal. I'll, I'll sustain as to this characterizing what other witnesses are or aren't as biased. Can you continue with your answer, leaving aside the fact that these experts are unbiased? Objection. Apologies, I just updated the banner because now it's been the cross examination for a few minutes there. Okay, it's cross examination. The state is asking. Can you finish your answer, please? Yes, I forget where I was, honestly. Could you restate the question? Was your investigation unbiased? Yes, it was. Can you describe why? Uh, because of the reasons I just spoke to. Um, and, the, and the fact that we want the facts and the evidence speak for itself. You were asked a question early on from counsel about whether you took into account emotional hardships someone might be suffering. Do you remember that? Yes, I do. And did you do so? Absolutely. Can you describe why or how? Well, anytime you respond to a crime scene or an incident, and in my particular case, in, in my experience, I've been to a lot, uh, whether it be as a patrol officer or as an investigator responding to um, a death scene. And at every death scene, whether it be natural, unnatural, suicide, homicide, uh, people are dealing with the most extreme moment in their life, right? Um, so everyone responds a little differently to that stress and the pressure. Unfortunately, most of the time it, it takes, we don't have the experience uh, or the background to know what that person's normal baseline is. Uh, in this particular case, uh, I do know Dan Howard. I have dealt with Dan Howard. And so I, compared to other people, I feel that I had, and other officers on scene, had a better baseline for how he deals with and handles stress. We watched you and Detective Oilers' interviews over the course of a couple of days. Do you feel like you treated Dan Howard like you would any other person? I treated Dan Howard with uh, nothing but respect, just as I do everyone I deal with. We saw some of that. I think he makes some excellent points, you know. While normally people don't know the baseline, he's like, I have known him for many years. Excellent point. You were asked some questions about the moment that Brooke called her stepdad back and essentially accused her of killing Kendi. Do you remember that? I'll never forget it. And I think in the, uh, in the recording, we heard you talk to Dan about that. Is that accurate? Yes. And I think here, on direct, you said that caused you to be suspicious. Fair? Yes. Why? Well, in all the years that I've responded to these types of scenes, um, especially one that originally came out as a suicide call, uh, not one time have I ever, do I ever recall seeing a family member respond in that manner to another family member. Did Dan's demeanor change when Brooke said that to him, and you followed up with questions about why Brooke thought he killed her mother? Yes. Can you tell us about that? Uh, he was very shaken up over it. Um, that was really the first time that I noticed that night that, that there were some genuine uh, emotions coming from Dan Howard. It was after his phone call with Brooke. Do you think that despite this suspicion that the investigation that went on for the next couple of years was unbiased. A hundred percent. Why do you say that? Uh, because of the same reasons I spoke to earlier. Uh, this was not just one person um, conducting this investigation. This was a very complicated and a difficult investigation that was, you know, which caused us to have to utilize um, a lot of experts and uninvolved individuals.
<laughs> Lakeside lawyer says, at the most extreme moment in Dan Howard's life, he left some cheesy radio station playing in the back. Yes, he did. Had Carrier Brett bothered to reach out to the sheriff's department, had bothered to reach out to you, would you have gladly interviewed them? Of course I would have. Just like we did the many other people who contacted us. The search warrant that was served on February 17th, 2021, I think counsel asked you about whether or not Mr. Howard's father was there. Remember that? Yes. And can you describe what you did as a result of that? Uh, I left the scene with Mr. Howard and met him down at a local restaurant where we sat and had coffee and chatted How long during the search warrant, during the majority of that search warrant. Why did you do that? Uh, to get him off scene so that people could work without him being in the way. This incident during execution of the second search warrant on the 17th and an attempt to confirm what Dan had said about some incident years ago and firing a bullet through the floor. Was there any evidence from any other person that supported what Dan said had happened other than Dan? Yes. And who was that? Wyatt Howard, Dan and Kendi's son. But isn't it true that Wyatt heard it from his dad? That's my understanding, yes. And so what Wyatt knows about that he got from his dad? Yes, portions of it. And so this entire story is something that Dan could have made up, right? Sure. Because there's no one else to say otherwise, right? Yeah, that'd be correct. No further questions. Thank you. Reader? Yes, please, Ron. So, in relationship to the incident in uh, July of 2020, when was that charged? Objection, Your Honor, directly. It's also irrelevant. Your Honor, directly. <laughs> Objection, beyond the scope. And the judge is like, it is also irrelevant and beyond the scope. <laughs> it deals to whether or not Ms. Maitland or Mr. Gunderson would have the knowledge to go and respond to police officers. No, it's irrelevant as to charging decisions, sustaining the objection. To your knowledge, was there anything that witnesses of a July 10th event would know to contact Objection. Wow. Well, <laughs> I'm just like, wow. They're talking about those two friends from yesterday. You know what? I, I'm understanding better the scope of your question. Um, I'm over. I'm reversing my ruling. You can ask about when it was charged. I understand. I understand your question now. I'm allowing it. Thank you, Ron. To your knowledge, was the incident of July. 10th, 2020, when was that charged? Objection know. relevance. That's a well, different question than the first two. It's just worded just a little bit differently than the first one, Your Honor. I think that, that's the same question. I don't, he answered he doesn't know, but I'm overruling the objection. What was your answer? I, I don't recall. I believe it was last year. Okay. Last year being 2023? Correct. So would Mr. Gunderson or Ms. Maitland have reason to know to contact law enforcement regarding a bruise in July of 2020? Counselor, I also speculation into two other people's frame of mind. Understood. It is speculation. Sustained. Counsel asked you about your former relationship. Were you and Dan friends? No. No further questions, Mark. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I love how he says that. No.
<laughs> well, you and Dan friends know. And he looks away. No, definitely not. <laughs> Moonchild says, member for one month and one day. Oh, happy grizzly anniversary to you and thank you for the sticker. Okay, we've got the next witness here. So this would be defense witness, officially number, <laughs> number six. This is uh, one of Dan's besties. Okay, so <laughs> prepare yourself. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Can you please state your name and spell your name for the record? My name is Christopher McCullough. I have a lot of middle names. Just first and last name, here, right? Yes. C H R I S T O P H E R M C C U L L O U G H. Where do you live? I live in Bergen City, Utah. What do you do for work? I work for a company called Siemens, and I'm what they call a technical consultant. To make it simple, I am a factory rep when people buy expensive industrial measurement equipment, they need somebody to come and teach them how to use it. Or when they want to think about buying it, I want to help the salespeople finish the sale. Do you know Dan? Yes. How do you know? It's been one of my closest friends for, holy crap, 43 years. Shame the guy smiles at him. He's like, yeah, that guy's my bestie. That guy, Dan, he's my friend for 43 years. Oh, my. Uh, do you know Kendi? Yes. Prior to her passing, um, how often would you interact with Dan? Our friendship is one of those where we talk four or five times and go a couple of years. Then I come up and see a brother or a sister or a friend who lives here, or come up and see Dan and I'm driving through, and then we get back up and it's like you never, it's like a, a sentence that kind of finished halfway and then you pick it up the next day, week, month, year, and you not miss a beat, so. Did you grow up with him? Yes. Now, how did you learn about Kendi's passing? Dan called me. Sorry, someone. AC <laughs> says, ew. <laughs> ew. Yeah, he likes his friend. Dan Howard. 43 years. Okay. Tina, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Sure. Did you come up at any point after you found out about her passing? Yes, I did. Can you explain? Right when she passed, Dan has close family friends. Yes, you know. Foundational error. Hold on. You can continue. After I found out, um, we um, figured he was, I figured he was well supported, had a lot of friends around him. And he had to keep his job, so he went back to Alaska. And we stayed in touch. And then we came back out here. How long did you stay here? Uh, about a week, I believe. You have the opportunity to observe his demeanor? Absolutely, yes, sir. Can you describe that? He's broken hearted. Broken hearted. Um, he had, uh, was in the middle of a process. He, um, I've been close with him in my life. He's in uh, the middle of a process. His marriage was on the rocks, and all of a sudden his wife was gone. And uh, uh, we, we talk, and time went we toward Kendra, we got around her stuff. Um, he'd start to tear up and kind of. Jackie, not responsive. Overall, the narrative you directly. Hey. Question. You, were, uh, you were describing... <laughs> the way he looks at the judges well, these ones that swing their heads around. What? Was it being naughty? <laughs> oh, my. I know he's speaking very, very softly. Okay, we've reached the ASMR portion of our trial. Two hours, 18 out of 3.35. For his the demeanor when you were talking on the subject of uh, his wife. Come on. Yes, so she was... Objection uh, meeting and ask an answer at this point. He, he hasn't answered it yet. Yeah. Oh, you can finish your answer. Hmm. Pick up my sentence real quick here. Why don't you ask another question? Yeah, please. So, it, just to, uh, you know, briefly describe... Um, Broken hearted. Okay. Distraught. Where did you stay when you were up here for that week? In Dan and Kenny's home. Where did he sleep? In one of the extra bedrooms. 
What was the state of his house? As you might find a house from one day to the next, relatively clean and in good order. Um, and then I was there to help him get through coming home after being up on the slope, trying to process what was going on around. But this the house was in relatively good order. Kenny kept a pretty clean house. Dan kept a pretty clean house. In the course of you working with him, did you have an opinion on what he should do with any of her belongings? I actually. Yeah, I know um, you guys were saying as well, he speaks very, with a very low tone and quite softy, so it's a little bit hard to hear, but. <laughs> you guys saying closed captions gone either yeah for some of the trial closed captions <laughs> it just gets some words a little bit mixed up there uh, lakeside lawyer says i don't trust soft-spoken grown men <laughs> he's he's gonna cause us to meditate isn't he he's hypnotizing us <laughs> better not sir anyway it gets interesting no spoilers brought up in testimony yesterday your honor it's not proper opinion presentation testimony judge opinion is a bit relevant did you did you not what they were but did you express any thoughts about yes but, oh, you gotta wait for a question sorry we didn't have any questions council might have an opportunity to object and yes, did the topic of uh kennedy's some of kennedy's clothing and stuff come up yes Did you make any suggestions? I did. What were they? Objection here, sir. Overall, although it's not for the truth of the matter, sir, but simply for what he said, whether it's true or not, it's not for the jury to work out. While we were driving back and forth um, in the course of helping deal with his house, um, I saw a place that, and I followed up on it, that helped with uh, belongings of people that they would buy things. And uh, I suggested every time after watching every time we walked past the case of chickens that was full of memorabilia, so like that, I would uh, assign how it went to him. And I realized things needed to change, so I suggested that we call that, that business and have them come in and tell us what they do. Did you observe him grieve? Yes, that's why I suggested it. I wanted to change the, name, the, state, the state of the house. No further questions, John. Cross examination. <laughs> he speaks almost like a like a psychic or someone very into the energy, you know, feng shui or something. Because it's like, ooh, the energy of those chickens. I don't know if you saw about the glass chickens. Surprised Jason wasn't like chicken. <laughs> uh, he's like that had to change. Okay, we had to clean and clear that house basically. Okay, sorry, now I'm speaking loud compared to him. Cross examination time. <coughs> Well, it, it sounds like you've got some opinions about Dan Howard and the fact that he was brokenhearted, right? He was brokenhearted, sir. And it sounds like you've got an opinion that he was grieving, right? He was grieving, sir. Did you know that his wife, right before she died, had about 30 separate instances of blunt force trauma all over her body? I don't believe that, sir. Okay, did you know that? As I said, I don't believe it. I'm not asking you whether you believe it or not. I'm asking you. <laughs> like literally, if he has the facts in front of him, doesn't believe it, no matter what. He is staying in denial, okay? If you know that. No. Okay, so if that was proved to you beyond any doubt in the course of this trial, you wouldn't believe it? Objection. Is that where you're at? Objection is to the uh, question. Form. You know, sustain the objection. Why don't you believe it? Dan and I's characters are known to each other, and he would never strike a woman, except in the course of being an officer, uh, to protect himself from the people. Right. I've observed him for years. He would never. So he observed him for years, but only saw him like once a decade, okay? But he knows, knows his character. He'd never strike a woman. Not Dan Howard. So it sounds like you can't neutrally evaluate evidence if it 
pertains to Dan Howard. Is that is that correct? I don't understand. Well, you wouldn't believe it, is what you said when I told you she had about 30 different areas where blunt force trauma was inflicted on her body. Remember that? Objection to the characterization, Your Honor. There's no, it's not a, a fact that it was inflicted upon her. There's 30 instances of bruises, aka blunt force trauma. Doesn't mean it was inflicted upon her. This characterization of the evidence. Any response? I think the evidence in this case speaks for itself, Judge. On that basis of an objection, I'll allow the question to stand. You can answer it. Okay. <coughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I posted a good point. He's having a coughing fit like I do. He needs one of my little Dr. Fogel <laughs> cough drops. It's what I reach for all the time <laughs> uh, throughout this trial. Jennifer says, did he ever talk to Kendi? That would be a good question. Did he? The way you're asking the question is asking me to conclude something that I don't think I'm capable of. So I'm going to paint a picture that I can see, but how that picture got painted, I disagree with. Well, let me try to paint that picture for you. Very much. Or prior to this, after he collects the exhibit, maybe briefly approach before the question. Or, or I think it might even be outside the presence, you know? Six seconds. I think right. it might be. Okay, so outside the presence of the Excuse me, briefly. <laughs> Jury has to get up and go out again. Your Honor, I think it's improper to try to impeach a lay witness with exhibits admitted uh, by experts when many of the uh, injuries were uh, after autopsy, or as far as documented after autopsy, uh, by several days. Uh, the autopsy was on the 3rd, the coroner took photos on the 8th. Uh, the doctor uh, testified that um, he didn't re review them or the chart until later on. I mean, it's purview of expert testimony. And to have a lay person be shown a picture of purple or bluish area and not know the difference between a contusion or blunt force trauma or a bruise or a cause, I think it's the improper impeachment of a lay witness, Your Honor. That's a purview of the experts. That's not, that's definitely outside the scope of cross. And uh, I would ask that uh, uh, he not be allowed to try to be impeached by uh, expert opinions of potential or expert opinions of Bruzy. Thank you. Ms. Berger. Judge, I think this witness has made an inference that he has a bias and that no matter what, he wouldn't believe something against Dan Howard because of his relationship with Dan Howard. I think that was an inference that one can reasonably draw here in the initial questions that I asked him. 19B has already come into evidence. 19B has been seen by this jury a couple of times. 19B is evidence that would go to refute or explore the bias that this potential witness has. If he would not believe evidence that this jury has seen throughout this case, I'm not sure why they, the jury would believe anything he would have to say. So it's come into evidence. It's fair game. It's no different than any other instance where a character witness, if you will, has an opinion of somebody. And then the rebuttal question, obviously, is going to be, if you knew this, would you still have the same opinion? And that's all that I'm doing. And it's completely permissible, Judge. Your Honor, again, it's not like showing, well, did you know someone was, you know, X, or do you know that she had a broken arm? Uh, the, the coloration is still in the purview of the jury, whether those are contusions caused by normal occurrences, whether it was a struggle, whether it was after autopsy, which is a violent procedure, as Dr. Howard testified. Those should, that's. Did you listen at all? It can't happen after autopsy. They can appear or be more pronounced, but the bruising cannot occur after someone has died. It's not the proper impeachment of a lay witness, and I think it's a mischaracterization of the lay witness. Certainly, any other area of impeachment that, that counsel wants to go to may be appropriate, but this is an inappropriate area of impeachment.
Well, I, I don't, <clears throat> I don't believe this is proper cross. The scope of his direct was he didn't opine as to Mr. Howard being peaceful or you know, not violent towards his wife or anything like that. He simply testified to being up here, his observations of Mr. Howard's demeanor and grieving and so forth. And that's all fair. That's, that's fair. Um, not rebuttal is the wrong word, but that's fair evidence to as against the state's evidence of his demeanor and so forth. Um, whether or not, I, I, I don't find it proper to essentially put on the case to this witness and then ask him if he believes it or not. He's, he's been clear that he wouldn't believe. Uh, the point has been made by Mr. Bernhardt that he wouldn't believe that Mr. Howard would injure his wife, regardless of what the evidence might be. Um, and, uh, the, the, the state certainly has painted that. The, his comments about, about not believing Mr. Howard capable of hurting a woman or hurting a wife or so forth, if that were brought out on direct, then maybe this would be fair, but that was uh, essentially brought up on cross-examination. I don't think it's appropriate to set him up on cross and then further impeach him uh, on something he didn't testify on in direct. At this point, I, I think it's, um, it, right, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I, I'm not going to allow it. I think it's, it's um, I, I don't think it's proper at this point. And so um, I'll sustain the objection. I take it that is just a 19B judge? Well, I, I'm saying to, to impeach this witness with a bunch of the exhibits and ask him if he thinks Mr. Howard did it, I think is far beyond direct. Okay, so I take it your ruling is I can't impeach him with exhibits, but everything else I can? Well, I, I'm not sure exactly. I guess I'll see what you do. But what my ruling right now is that it's not proper to show him autopsy photos and ask him if he thinks Dan did that or didn't do that and so forth. And that's what is, isn't what I was doing, Judge. Okay. I do, I do find, Your Honor, that the court is right as far as setting up his own impeachment. We didn't go in that direction. I'll, I'll see where you go, I guess. But I, I'm just saying, I don't think it's proper to present him with a bunch of exhibits. And uh, unless it's directly impeaching his direct, his direct question, his direct testimony, then I suppose we can. But, um, but in terms of setting him up to further impeach him on things that he didn't talk about on the graph. I think that would be cool. Let's bring the jury around. Would you believe that Dan was broken hearted if you knew that shortly before Candy Howard died, she sustained a second degree burn to her arm? Objection. I'm going to sustain the objection. Have you ever had someone not tell you the truth? Yes, sir. Have you ever had someone give you a false chain of events? Yes, sir. And you believe them nonetheless? Yes. And have you done that because you trusted them? Yes, sir. In this case, um... Damn, he's got to watch a little bit more stuff with us, right? You got to spot the red flags, sir. <laughs> They're like, if you see all the red flags, do you still trust someone? Yes. Be careful with that. Did you know that Courtney Lambert tried to buy Candy Howard's chicken collection for Candy's granddaughter? I knew there was some debate about it, where it would get sold, but I don't know the specifics who tried to buy what. What was the debate as you understand it? I just suggested he sell them as quickly as possible, because there's so many of them. And he said he was trying. Did you suggest he sell them to Candy's next to Ken? No, sir. I didn't, uh -huh. I didn't suggest either way on that, sir. It was just a matter of cleaning the space. So it wasn't constantly reminded of his wife's passing in the collections that she lined the walls with. It sounds like you're... Like someone said earlier, why not give it to her kids then? Her daughter? Hmm? Or a son, I'm just saying. Like, why does it have to be given away or sold? You're the kind of friend that would stick behind Dan Howard no matter what. Is that accurate? 
If he told me he did it, I would not stick behind him. I would suggest he do the right thing and turn himself in. If he told you he didn't do it, you'd stick by him, wouldn't you? I believe it to be true. That's correct, sir. Because he said so, right? Forty years of living and being together says so, sir. I get that. But you're believing him because he said so, right? That's a kind of a question of vacuum, sir. I believe him because I know him. Okay. But you don't know the facts of this case, do you? Some of them, sir. But I wasn't allowed to watch up to this point, so... But you have been watching. Online. I watched the... Oh, he walked into that one. <laughs> this defense... I'm sorry. This prosecutor is very good. He picks up on everything, of course. Like, wait, wait, wait. So you have been watching. Okay. A, a small section. I didn't believe, Your Honor. I didn't believe that they would publish this real time. And so I logged on um, when it was, I think, the second day. And um, I saw the comments rolling. And I got a really sick feeling that I shouldn't be doing it. I made a comment that he didn't do it. And then I logged off. Oh, I don't know how long that was. I was. Oh, my word. <laughs> okay, so wasn't on our chat <laughs> because he watched live coverage okay we've got live streams but one day behind so he he, he saw the live coverage <laughs> decided to chat along and say dan didn't do it even though he got a feeling that ooh, i shot i should probably not be watching this he watched and then commented dan didn't do it oh my goodness yeah, at my job so i worked and walked away and so. so when you were at work, you watched this trial? I work from home. When so. you were at work, you watched this trial? Yes, sir. And then you commented on this trial? I think it was around breakfast time, yes, sir. So, yes, I would taken a break and I was looking at it. So I take it that you, among the thousands of other people who watched this trial, you made some comments about the trial? I think I made two, maybe three. You'll, you'll have a record, I'm sure, sir. Did you make these comments? Oh, now it's two or three comments. <laughs> oh dear. To the thousands of people that are watching it? There's a chat box I just typed in. Is that a yes? I don't know how many people were watching. Does it have like a tower on it? I didn't look. You so. just looked at the testimony of the witnesses that were testifying? No. There were, may I describe the witnesses that were testifying? No, I don't think so. Judge, um, this witness has watched the trial on direct contravention of the order of the court. I moved to strike his entire testimony at this point. I didn't receive a instruction. Uh -huh. Let me, uh, Commissioner Bordario. Get that revolving door ready. Yes. You said you logged on. Where did you log on? YouTube, sir. Did you know that what you logged on to was a live stream? I thought it was recorded from the day before, but. Then I saw the comments. I guess I became aware of it. Somewhere around. Uh oh. <laughs> He's like, I thought it was a recording from the day before. Did you watch with us? Did we see anyone with this name roll in here and say, hey, 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 Dan didn't do it? <laughs> I didn't see that. That after that first day, um, did you get a call from either uh, Dan or myself regarding whether or not you should watch? The video? Yes, sir, from you. Education meeting. Well, he already answered it. And did you actually observe testimony in this case? No, sir. Uh, maybe we approach one. Uh, it, it might be necessary to be off the record, I guess. Do you on? I'm in on. I'm in on. Revolving door. Okay, the jury's out of the room again. Wow. <laughs> this is quite quite a turn of events, huh? <laughs> so now we're two hours thirty-seven out of three hours thirty-five. Your Honor, I, some of this is stuff that I, I don't think should be in front of the jury. Um, well, did, did you not understand what an order of exclusion of witnesses? Yes, absolutely, Your Honor. And no one knew that it was going to be live streamed. We had media. No one knew it was going to be live streamed. We knew they were going to be recording. 
And it, like, so it would be okay for a witness to no. watch the recording from the day before? Did not, no, he did That's what he just said he was trying to do. He logged on to a YouTube clip. Right? I don't, I, I'm not speaking for him. I'm speaking for... No, no, no. <laughs> he watched something with live chat embedded. So that's a live stream. He said there's a chat box where he was chatting <laughs> live. Oh, man. What a naughty, naughty witness. <laughs> the the what occurred is that first day actually wasn't until the second day i think the first end of the first day we realized it was live streamed did you tell your witnesses they were excluded? yes as soon as we found out it was live, live streamed absolutely we did as soon as we found out it was live streamed we instructed all our witnesses do not i had a phone call and when my phone call with uh mr ricola uh, you know my understanding is that uh he had logged on to something but he hadn't watched any testimony he, he had made a comment. My understanding is he hasn't watched any testimony. And that's his, uh, I believe that's his testimony right there. No, he literally just said, can I describe the testimony? <laughs> He's like, can I describe what I watched? <laughs> the prosecutor's like, no, nah, I don't think so. Yes, sir. That's correct. So what did you log on to do? I didn't believe that these types of things would be streamed live. I'm sorry. I didn't think in Idaho. I thought maybe in California or someplace like that. And so I... Um, Actually, no, we wish California would live stream more. They don't. You know, we know from Gareth Persas's trial, there's quite a few actually, where they don't live stream it like that. Mm -hmm. did, did you know that you were not supposed to, that you were excluded as a witness and not supposed to view the trial? I was not instructed at that point yet. I, uh, Nobody told you that at the beginning? I knew I couldn't be in the room, but when it, when it went public like that, it seemed like you, uh, the court changed the rules. Don't be disrespectful, sir. So you knew you couldn't be in the room, but you thought you could watch the room? It's confusing to me, sir. <laughs> it was confusing to him. Didn't understand this one-day delay, defluff stuff. Like he's just gonna watch the comment. <laughs> My word. So. All right. Well, um, it's certainly in contravention to. The court's order on exclusion of witnesses. Um, yeah, I may respond to Mr. Johnson's comments. Well, it's Mr. Verheren's witness, so. Um, I don't know that it's. I'm not necessarily going to strike his testimony. I think he's been thoroughly. Uh, I think this has been thoroughly shown to the jury, the uh, inappropriateness of the behavior. Uh, if the state has any further cross, I'll allow it. Uh, and, then, and then the witness is done. I'm not going to allow you to so. Well, may I you may. make a record? For the record, Judge, I still stick by my motion to strike his testimony. You, you have initial testimony from this witness that he watched witnesses. Now, that's changed as he was questioned by Mr. Johnson, but nonetheless, it was out there. So you, you have evidence that he has watched this trial, the contravention of the court's order, that he has commented on this trial, that he has talked to counsel about that, that counsel has kept that from us yet again with yet again another witness, and we're finding out what counsel has done via a witness when that witness is on the stand testifying. So this isn't like the first time Mr. Johnson has spoke about something that we later find out in terms of the witness testifying. Obviously, that's happened in short order here. I think the most appropriate thing to do, based on these circumstances, based upon the blatant disregard of this court's order, and keeping in mind, even if it wasn't live stream, if it was recording and you want to take him at his word, it doesn't matter. It, this testimony needs to be stricken. What if it was a recording that was live streamed a day later <laughs> with a one day delayed trial coverage? The purpose of the exclusion order is so that witnesses can't um, correlate their testimony with what they're seeing um, and to prevent bias. It's been demonstrated, everything you just said has been demonstrated in front of the jury um, that he, everything you just said has been demonstrated to the jury. I think they're in the best position to evaluate his credibility after having heard all of that. And I think they can make the appropriate determination uh, whether or not he's credible or 
what, are, what weight to give to this customer. And I don't, I, I, I don't see a need to order all of this testimony stricken. Rather, the record's been made of what you did. And uh, the jury, I trust, will take that into account when they consider this credibility. So, um, if you had any further cross on that, I would allow it. Um, otherwise, I'm going to, I'm not going to allow further questioning of the witness, given the violation of the court's order by, by defense. But if you had anything else you wanted to cross on, or if you want to leave it at that, we'll leave it at that. Thank you. Do you know which? I'm still thinking, Jennifer. Okay. Fair enough. Right, let's see You can see that. Thank you, Judge. Sir, I know you mean well. And I know that your friendship with Dan Howard is very important to you. But now, we've listened to you say that you'll believe him over the evidence what I said. presented in this case, right? Well, I haven't seen the evidence presented in this case. But you've told us it doesn't matter, right? I said if he told me that he did it. I would tell him to turn himself in. And now we've learned that despite the court's order that witnesses shouldn't sit in the courtroom or listen to the trial, you did so anyway. I had not received that order at that time, sir. Okay. And that you've commented on this case, right? At that same moment, I had not received that order. That's correct. So it was sounds, an interactive forum. It sounds like whatever you've done in the case and whatever opinions you have, um, it's for the benefit of Dan Howard? It's for the benefit of the truth, sir. The truth? Yes, sir. And that's what you're saying today, the truth? The whole truth and nothing but the truth, sir, yes. Based on what? Based on everything I've experienced. You have other witnesses that have other experiences? They come out and do the same thing. I'm just... How do you know? <laughs> Don't walk into it again now. He's like, well, you have other witnesses. They've had their experiences. Oh... Saw that, did you? <laughs> Based on my knowledge of my friend, defending my friend because I know him to be a good and decent man. Would you consider yourself to be a gullible person? No, sir. Thank you. I wish you could say, well, you are. This is a very gullible person. Shame, oh my word. Not only does he believe what, he, what his friend tells him, no matter what, but he also thinks he could watch a trial with us <laughs> when he's going to testify for his friend, you know, for the defense in honor of his good friend. I'm not allowing any redirect given the witnesses contravention of the court's order. Sorry about that. Thank sir. you, sir. You may step down. Yes, sir. Your Honor, the uh, last witness uh, for today is Mr. Betty's watching now. <laughs> Hello, sir. <laughs> he's going to watch what we're all saying about it. Yeah, he's probably watching now. Oh, my goodness. Sorry, but um, you're very gullible. Oh, dear. Okay, 2 hours 45. We've got uh, 50 minutes or so left. Why Howard um, is 20 till, rather than cutting his testimony up, would this be a good time to take him? To, to uh, have a bit afternoon break. So many times Jason Johnson asked for a break, like, should we take a break now? Lunch now? Coffee break now? How about now? And the judge is like, nah, not now. <laughs> He's like, uh, okay. Why don't we continue on? We'll probably break about 3.30. We possibly didn't do that in there. Okay. Next one. Wyatt Howard. Okay. Good afternoon. Okay. So this is Dan Howard's son. Also, Kendi's son, and he's testifying for the defense, which we'll have to hear what he says. It just makes me a little sad, you know, that his, his, his mom was allegedly murdered, but he's testifying for his dad. Of course, the defense would have called him, but okay, this is Wyatt Howard. Good afternoon. Can you please state your name and spell your name for the record? Say that again. Can you please state your name and spell your name for the record? Wyatt, W-Y-A-T-T. -T. And Howard? Howard, H-O-W-A-R-D. And where do you live? Post Falls, Idaho. Who are, you, who, um, who are your parents? Daniel Howard, Kenny Howard. 
Do you have a sister? Yes, sir. Steph's sister. And what's her name? Brooke Wilkins. How old are you? 27 years old. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Athelite. Um, prior to your mom's passing, what was your relationship with your sister? Our uh, relationship was good before. What kind of activities would you do as a family uh, growing up? Uh, sporting events, boating, camping, uh, kind of just the normal activities. Okay. Did you have any particular coaches for some of your sporting events? Uh, yes, my dad was involved in coaching for some years. Okay. Uh, when you graduated, uh, what year did you graduate? I graduated in 2015. What did you do after that? I enlisted in the Marine Corps. Okay. Well, what do you do now? Uh, I am a foreign business. Now, um, what was your relationship uh, like with your mom? Uh, my relationship was really good with my mom. Okay. Loved her? What was that? Loved her? Yes, sir, very much. Okay. What was your relationship like with your dad? It was good. Why have you ever gone shooting with your parents? Uh, yes, sir. Can you describe that to the jury? Uh, Went shooting two, probably two times with both my dad and my mother at the same time. Uh, we'd go to the ISP range on the weekends. Then my mom would participate. She participated twice, I believe. And that's about it. Where's the ISP range from? It's off Old 95. Okay. Kind of close to your house? Or to your parents' house? Probably about 10 minutes away. Okay. Now, at some point, was there ever an incident involving a gunshot within the house while you were there? Uh, yes, sir. Can you explain that? Uh, and let me, I'm not asking for any statement. Just a quick pause. Uh, Christina, you're right. There was a lot of fluff on this day. I mean, to go from 7 hours 20 to 3 hours 35, yeah, this happened. You said, I know this was missed in the D-flat, but James wanted the break. Uh, Mr. Johnson, right? Wanted the break. 10 minutes, but Wyatt wasn't there. <laughs> the bailiff called his name. He wasn't there. They ended up taking a 45-minute break to locate him. Yes. Or anything, just what you observed. <clears throat> uh, from what I observed, uh, there's a round that came through the ceiling. Do you have some lack of foundation as to when this happened? You can lay some foundation. Uh, this incident you're referring to, when did this happen? Uh, sometime when I was in middle school, I would say. Where were you in the house? I was downstairs in the basement. Speaking of downstairs, can you describe kind of um, what the downstairs is like? Uh, you have a bar area in the left corner, left closest corner, uh, wood stove. Then you have a wood box that contains firewood. Uh, that's that side. Then the other side you have a recliner, a couch, and another chair, and then a coffee table in between those. When um, the wood stove is burning, uh, is it loud? It uh, could be. Okay. It depends on what? I think it depends on the oxygen the fire's getting. Okay. It could be making like a whooshing sound. Okay. Now, this incident you observed in middle school, you said you were downstairs? Yes, sir. What did you observe? I observed, uh, I was sitting in the recliner, and I observed a round that came through the ceiling, and it ricocheted and went somewhere, and that was about it. Okay. With, without saying anything that was said, did either of your parents um, address the round that was shot? Uh, I believe my dad. Objection hearsay. Music address. Without, I'll just rephrase the question. All right, I'll sustain it. Um, without saying what they said, did anyone talk to you about that? Uh, I believe my father did. Okay. Now, growing up. Uh, did you guys go on trips? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. As an adult, uh, would you go on the trips with your parents? 
Uh, yes, sir. A little different kind of trips, but yeah. Okay. In 2020, um, did you go to Dorshack? Yes, sir. And who was there? Uh, I believe my mom, dad, uh, Michelle Lampert, Dean Lampert, um, my girlfriend Tiffany, uh, my friend Caleb Peck. Um, that's all I can remember at this time. There's probably a couple more though. Okay. Um, when did you get down there? What was that? Do you remember when you got down there? I I do not. Okay. When you were there, did you notice any uh, marks or bruises on your mom? I did not. Okay. Why? How did you find out about your mom's passing? Uh, from my father. Was that through a phone call? Yes, sir. Okay. What did you do? I got dressed and then headed to Athol, to the residence. Was there a viewing in this matter? For your uh, mom? Was there a viewing? For inside the house? No, I'm sorry. After your mom passed, was there a viewing in Coeur d'Alene? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, what was your... Did you have contact with your mom's side of the family at that time? Uh, yes, sir. Good. Um, do you remember who all attended the viewing? Um, I believe it was my sister, grandparents, uncle, uh, and then there was two other people. Uh, I think one of them was Sherry, I can't remember her last name. Um, and Kenley, my sister's daughter. Okay. And then my father afterward, after they left. Okay, we'll, we'll come back to that. <clears throat> Did you have any concern that there might be conflict? You said Ken Lee, my sister's daughter, because Brooke's daughter's name is Ken Lee. Beautiful name as well. It's like Ken D. It's also a nice name, right? It must really suck, you know, to be Dan's only son. Like, to be here on the stand knowing, okay, your dad's on trial for the murder of your mother. I mean, that's just horrible. Looked if your dad showed up at the same time as other people. Objection. Relevance. Let me answer. Yeah, ask a question here. Did you have any concern that might, there might be conflict uh, if your father showed up at the same time as the rest of the family? Uh, yes, sir. Do you know where your dad was while um, during the viewing where the rest of the family was viewing? Uh, he was across the road at Capone's. After the family left, what what happened? Can you tell the jury what happened after that? Uh, my father walked over, and then we went into the viewing together with myself, my girlfriend, and him. Did you stay with him the whole time? Uh, yes, sir. I believe so. Did you attend the memorial down in Camia? Yes, sir. Did you, and at that point, did you still have contact with your mom's side of the family? Uh, yes, sir, I believe so. Did you have any concern on whether there would be conflict if your father had shown up to that? Uh, yes, sir, I did. Did you express that to your father? Did you express that to your father? Yes, sir, I did. Were you coordinating the uh, viewing service? Uh, what do you mean? Like, were you helping facilitate put it together? Uh, I can't remember if I helped or not. Okay. Now, <clears throat> was there a time after your mom's passing where your dad had a yard sale? Uh, yes, sir. Can you describe that? Uh, it was his belonging, belongings, some of my mother's belongings. Uh, it's just a really yard sale, you would see. Were you present? Uh, yes. Uh, who all was present? Mm, I believe it was myself, my father, um, Carrie Murray, my girlfriend's mother. Um, 
than whoever was visiting to buy stuff. Did, at that time, did your sister show up? Uh, sometime during the event, yes, she did. Was there any sort of confrontation between you and your sister? Uh, yes, sir, there was. Before your mom's passing, can you describe to the jury what your dad's normal demeanor was? Uh, Hardworking, kind of uh, like a normal, normal guy, I would describe him as, I guess. Had you ever seen him cry prior to your mom's passing? Not that I remember. What about after? Uh, yes, after he did. Did you see the ashes um, of your mother? Yes. Can you describe uh, who... Uh, did you personally receive them? Uh, like the whole... Yes, I believe I did. No, the hundred percent of the ashes. Yes, I believe I did. And where did you receive them? I think I either picked them up from where the viewing was held, or uh, or my father gave me them. One of the two. Okay. Did you give any ashes to your sister? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Did you keep some for yourself? Uh, yes, sir. And did you give some to your dad? Yes, sir. Can you tell the jury what happened to the ashes? Do, well, let me rephrase. Do you know what happened to the ashes that you gave to your dad? I believe he spread them, spread them out on the property, like uh, more in the pasture area where all the animals and stuff that we raised lived. Were you with him at that time? Uh, I, th I think I was, yes. Can you describe that? I mean, do, you, do you know if you were? I, I don't know if I was or not, sir. All right. No further questions. Cross examination. Okay, let me ask you a question about the trip that you took with your parents to Dvorak in 2020, okay? You have to talk out loud because yeah. it's all being recorded. Yes, sir. All right. On this trip, I think when you were speaking with counsel, you said that you didn't notice any bruising on your mom. Is that accurate? Yes, that's accurate, sir. Okay, so today in court, you're telling us you saw no bruising on your mom at Dvorak in 2020 in the summer of... Is that accurate? I believe so, sir, yes. Okay. We still got 35 minutes left. Guten Abend <laughs> to Michael Schmidt. You say greetings from Germany to all the Grizzlies. Hello, Gisland. Thanks for the good word. Thank you so much for the sticker. Danke schön. Vielen Dank. <laughs> Council, I'm going to refer to Detective Wildton and Detective Oilers report, page 22. You need a copy of that. May I approach the witness, Judge? Okay. Yeah. I think you've seen this before, sir. <clears throat> Take a look yes, at that. And if you don't play with it. <clears throat> you've been asked questions about this particular interview before, haven't you? Yes, sir, in the grand jury. And you did so under oath like today, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Can you turn to page 22, please? Okay. All right. So on um, line 11, you were um, asked on, well, let's, let's go to line 13. Sergeant Lawton said the next incident question, right? Uh, yes, sir. And that followed a discussion about when you were down at Warshack with your parents, right? 
Yes, sir. And there on line 14, you said, quote, I don't know about that one. I just saw there was like a bruise and I asked her about it. Yes, sir. Line 16, Sergeant Monson says, bruises on your mom. What did you say there on line 17? I said, yeah. So, when we spoke with Sergeant Lowelton, that was quite some time before today, right? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. I, I realize that wasn't under oath, but today you were under oath, right? Yes, sir. And so, when you spoke to Sergeant Lowelton, was that the truth? Or when you spoke today under oath, was that the truth? I believe today would be the truth, sir. Okay, so you were not telling the truth to those detectives back when they interviewed you? Um, I possibly could have. I don't remember really what I said. Well, you're, you're looking at I'm what looking you at said, yes. Yes, right? Sir. Yes, sir. And so, can you tell us why you wouldn't have been truthful with the detectives? I cannot, sir. You just weren't? I guess so, sir. Okay. Oh, dear. <laughs> he wasn't being truthful with detectives. Sure. On direct examination, you talk with counsel about going shooting with your parents before, right? Yes, sir. And you talked about, you said you went twice before, right? Yes, sir. I believe it's twice. Okay. Can you take a look on page 29 for us? The same document. <clears throat> okay. On line 11, Sergeant Lowton asked you, but did she shoot? Did you ever see your mom shoot that gun? What was your response on line 13? Uh, I said I think we went out and shot. I do think we went once, and I know her and my dad went out, and they shot, shot it too. Okay. So, again, same kind of questions. Were you being truthful then, or today when you testified under oath? Uh, it could have been once or twice, I guess. Okay. You're not sure? I, I know she went out with us. It could have been once, maybe, but I thought it was twice. Okay. Shame. <laughs> For a second there, I think that, you know, Mr. Jason Johnson, the defense attorney, was starting to poke just a couple of holes in the state's case, right? By being like, oh, so she did go with to the ISP range. Okay, we haven't heard that before, and all the things, but now it's just falling apart. <laughs> the state is like, oh, okay, look at what you said here to detectives. He's like, oh, okay, maybe, maybe once then, maybe she just came with then. They're so good, right? <laughs> the state is so good. Going back to the bruise from Dvorak, um, would it help refresh your memory if you saw that bruise again? Um, it could, I guess. Okay. Because right now you don't remember it, right? No, sir, I don't really remember. Okay. Well, maybe we can get to that real quick. Take up the time off. Take up the time off. Let me ask you a couple more questions. Your dad didn't go to the viewing. You've told us today because he was scared of conflict? Um, scared that there would have been conflict, yes. Okay. Well, why? Uh, obviously because what the other family was thinking. Why would, that, why would that be obvious? What do you mean, sir? Why would it be obvious that there would be conflict? Well, you have people saying that he murdered her, and you have other people saying he didn't. And if you all go to a funeral, I would assume that would cause conflict. Why would people say he murdered her? I can't tell you, sir. Well, usually when someone kills himself, other people don't say that she was murdered, right? I mean, it could happen, sir, yes. It, it could, but usually it doesn't, does it? No, but it could. Why on earth in this particular case would the issue of your father murdering your mom 
come up? I have no idea, sir. You can't speculate based upon knowing both of them and their history together? Jason calls for speculation. Sustained. You have your own personal feelings about that, don't you? Uh, yes, sir, I guess so. And those personal feelings, do you think they affect how you're, you're testifying here today? Uh, no, sir. You don't think that your personal feelings are influencing you to tes testify for your father? Uh, no, sir. You're not familiar with the evidence that this jury has heard in this case, are you? No, sir. I, I take it, I hope, you haven't been watching this trial online. No, sir, I haven't. Okay. And so you don't know... <laughs> I was wondering if he's going to ask him, have you been watching? Did you watch Grizzly True Crime? <laughs> have you been watching this trial online? This, this, you know, this looks really difficult for him, and I mean... What if his dad really made a huge emotional fuss about Candy having an affair? Like, she, your mom cheated on me, and not the first time. Maybe, maybe his son was his shoulder to cry on. This is his only biological son. You know what I mean? Oh, man. Shame. This guy's in a very difficult position. In my opinion, based on his upbringing with Dan, you know, probably being quite close to him. Oh, what the jury's is listened to you over the course of two weeks, I take it. I have not, sir. Would it matter to you what the evidence was in terms of your personal opinion about what happened or not? Yes, sir, I believe evidence is evidence that does dictate okay. opinions. But yet you have this belief, this personal belief, without knowing that evidence? Yes, sir, as of now. Okay. You think you could change your mind? If you heard all the evidence that this jury has heard, objection uh, or speculation. <clears throat> oh, I have a question. It's just going to his ability to be objective in this moment. So, all that question. Say the question. They're going to ask it again. Um, Kathleen says Dan would have manipulated his son completely howling and sn snotting on his shoulder about his mom moving on. Terrible thing to do to your child. Especially because it, um, Wyatt was in the body cam. You know, Wyatt arrived after, I mean, Dan called him. Wasn't he the first person he called? He was one of the first few people he called. He called him and Wyatt came over and we saw him on some of that body cam so he can perform that way in front of Wyatt. That's what I mean, yeah, as well. Then then it means he could, he's already, that, that proves it's very manipulative, doesn't it? And maybe he did that type of performance in a premeditated way even about Kendi's affair and saying, like, can you believe what she did and all of that? So, oh, my. Almost kind of making that, you know, making him have that loyalty to him. Oh, but at least he says if he hears all the evidence, he could change his opinion. Would your mind be open to coming to a different conclusion if you heard the evidence that just this jury has heard over the course of a couple of weeks? Uh, yes, possibly, sir. Okay. That's up to experts, not me. Well. Actually, it's up to the people that are listening to the experts. They make that decision. This jury makes that decision. Yes, Not the experts. Question, no, the question asked. Would, would you be open to reassessing your beliefs after hearing all the evidence in this case? Yes, sir. I believe so. Okay. Can I approach your court, Judge? Your Honor, I'm going to have the same objections to the prior witness 
Go ahead and stick uh, three up on the elbow. Moonchild, that's the phrase we're looking for. Parental alienation. That's what I'm trying to say. It's a very real thing, and it's very sad. You should never do that. And I would speculate that Dan Howard did that. I think he would have been very close to his son. And be like, can you believe, even if you hear about the the funeral, right? <laughs> Dan playing victim, like, I'm just going to sit across the road and then we'll go afterwards. Because these people think I did it. These people are accusing me of murder, you know? I think he would have manipulated him big time to get empathy out of his son. Does that look like your mom? At Dvorak on July 16th, 2020, in the afternoon hours? Uh, yes, sir, the date would prove that true. Help refresh your memory about the bruise on your chest? Uh, I see. <laughs> I can't really tell in the photograph if there is or not. Okay. So even though you talked about this before with Detective Wilde and Detective Oiler and you've seen this photograph, you don't remember whether or not she was bruised in Warshack back in 2020? I don't recall if she was or not. Okay. So this yard sale that you had, that your dad sold your mother's stuff, is that accurate? And a lot of his stuff also. Okay. So he sold her clothes? Uh, I don't think her clothes were sold at the yard sale. So. He sold your clothes, what, via consignment? Uh, I believe it was bulk to a buyer. I don't know what buyer, but yeah, it's one one person in bulk. Your dad made some money off your mom's clothes? I would assume that there was money involved, yes. Okay. And then your dad sold what else of your mother's belongings? Um, I guess stuff bought that she bought from yard sales, uh, glass chickens, uh, maybe some other things. I can't remember. Okay, so possessions that she had laying around the house. Uh, yes, sir. In addition to the chickens. Uh, yes, sir. There might have been some other items too. Yeah. Okay. I can't remember exactly what they are. Okay. Um, did he sell other things of your mom's via consignment besides her clothes? I, I don't recall. Not sure? I don't think he did. Okay. So this yard sale then, um, was this at the house? Yes, sir, it was. Okay. And was it advertised in some fashion? Uh, I believe there's a couple signs, like out in front of the road and stuff like that. Okay. You didn't put it in the paper? Your dad didn't put it in the paper or something like that? I don't remember if he did or not, okay. or I didn't know about it. Evidently, your sister found out. Uh, yes, sir. And your sister came to the house she grew up in, right? Pausing, pausing. Savvy says, that's insane. Why doesn't think it's wrong to sell his mom's stuff? I see, that's what I mean. That It's like that curse of control, this parental alienation. I worry about, you know all the things that his dad had told him about his mom, right? Yes, sir. And found her mom's stuff being sold by her dad? Yes, sir. And did that include the glass chicken collection or not? That was being sold? Right. Yes, there were glass chickens being sold. Okay. Didn't that get sold to somebody else? Yes, sir. Okay, so that wouldn't have been part of the yard sale. Well, they were displayed at the yard sale. But someone didn't buy them at the yard sale? Yes, somebody did. Okay. Her collection was bought at the yard sale? Yes, sir. Her collection was not bought by some other buyer? 
uh, I believe it was bought, the person that bought them at the yard sale was actually a part of the family. But yes, they were bought by somebody. Okay. Didn't Courtney Lambert attempt to buy that collection? Outside school. Outside the school, I'm not sure it's hearsay, but also it's going to be a rejection. The yard sales. Um, Anita says Brooke knew the truth and was not drawn into Dan's crap. Yes, and Dan was not her biological father, right? This um, Wyatt, his dad is is Dan, and his mom is Kendi. So for Brooke, <laughs> maybe she always thought, what the hell is up with this guy? You know, with Dan. So easier for Dan to manipulate his biological son, Wyatt. Probably wanted to raise him to be just like him. Probably wanted him to be in law enforcement and everything. I don't know if he is or isn't, but yeah. Be on the scope. Courtney Lambert buying the chickens or Who's the buyer of the chickens? Uh, I don't believe. I don't remember her name exactly, sir. Was it Courtney Lambert? No, sir, it wasn't. Was it Kerry Maitland? Huh? <laughs> the one we saw yesterday. Because she was saying she also helped to set up, you know, the sale of things and all that. Got some of Candy's things. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Donna says, thank you for the transporting, or teleporting, and your funny snarks. <laughs> thank you so much, Donna. Really appreciate it. So, at this yard sale, um, Brooke wanted her mom's possessions, didn't she? Uh, yes, sir. I believe so. And instead of giving them to Brooke, your dad called the police? Um, yes, sir. He, he told her she was trespassing. It's because he didn't want her on the property. Your dad told his stepdaughter she was trespassing on the property she grew up in at the time her mom's stuff was being sold? Is that what you're telling us? Yes, sir. Why? Trespassing? Ouch. Um, probably because she was the one that accused him of murder. Accused him of what? Accused him of murder. So he was ups. So because Brooke accused Dan Howard of murder, saying like, you killed my mother. She did not kill herself. Oh, that's it. If she wants to come to collect some of her mom's things. Ah, trespassing. Oh dear. So your dad was upset at Brooke because she accused him of killing her mother. Is that what you're saying? Yes, sir. They're probably both upset so, at each other. So therefore, say my father was accusing her of trespassing when she showed up because he didn't want her on the property. Okay, so I take it then, in order to get some payback, your dad sold your mom's stuff despite Brooke wanting it. Is that what you're telling us? Objection cost for speculation. Why did your dad sell your mom's stuff if work wanted it? I believe he just wanted to get rid of it and get everything out of the house. Rook would have done that, <clears throat> right? Yes, sir, she could have. So, again, why didn't he give it to Brook? I can't tell you, sir. Let me show you. I'm just trying to like process this. It must be so horrible for Brooke. I mean, her mom was murdered. Mom just died, right? And then you want to go there and get some sentimental items. And when you get there, not only are you accused of trespassing, not allowed on the property, but you can't have any of your mom's stuff. That's just, that's really heartbreaking. A couple of documents. Take a look at that, tell me if you recognize the glass chickens. <clears throat> yes, sir. What do you recognize as glass chickens in the cabinet to be? Glass chickens. Kings, your mom's glass chickens? Yes, sir. You would know because you saw them for many years, right? Yes, sir. Does that appear to you to be an accurate photograph showing her glass chickens in the cabinet inside your house? Uh, yes, sir, I believe so. 
Okay, the next one I have for you is for you. E. Take a look at that. Tell me the recommendation. Uh, yes, sir, I do. What do you recommend is 41 E to be? Um, appears to be a Facebook advertisement of the yard sale. And does it show a picture of the yard sale that you've been talking about? Uh, yes, sir, it does. Is that a nice picture of the yard sale? Yes, sir. Move to admit 41 D and E. I see E again, though. <laughs> no, you can see my elbows coming out. I'm like, what's going on? I'm just like so upset for Brooke. Shame. Your Honor, we had objected to the admission of the exhibits as they call, uh, they contain hearsay from other individuals, not on the stand, not not the court. Where are you? Yes, please. Well, the objection made here is that we're overruling the objection is that these aren't statements are valid for the truth of the matter. So, we're going to be objected. Your Honor, is it possible to uh, redact the wording in there? Well, if the wording were here, then I would agree, but these aren't. Of course, it was offered for the truth of the matter asserted, but rather it's like contract words or words of negotiation. Um, so I won't find if it's offered for the truth of the matter asserted. So I'll overrule the hearsay section. It's published 41D and E. Okay, so 41D, sir, what are we looking at? Uh, you're looking at the antique cabinet of. Glass chickens. All right, and is this one? Okay, there's a lot of glass chickens. We can see them. We we saw a picture of two of them before. Should I collect a lot of glass chickens? Okay. Uh, Madeline says it was not White on body cam. It was the detective. No, White was there. He was there that day as well. Later. One single antique cabinet of glass chickens. Say that again. What's that? Say that again. Is that just one cabinet? Yes, sir. All right, and that would be the collection that Katie had amassed over a number of years of glass chickens. Yes, sir. Something that was very important to her? Uh, I'd say so if she collects that much. And this is the glass chickens your dad made sure would not go to Brooke or Kim. Objection. Is that right? Objection. Sustained. Let's take a look at the next one. What do we need? And again, if you wouldn't mind, sir, tell us what that's a photograph of. Uh, it's a photograph of the yard sale. Okay. And the objects that are out there, would that include your mom's clothing and possessions? Uh, I believe it'd be possessions. I don't know if there's clothing or not out there. That had all been sold previously? I think it was afterward. Uh, so just her kind of like knickknacks and things like that? I believe so, yes. And those were all sold to someone other than family that day? Um, I believe so, sir, yes. Now, when Brooke tried to stop that, did you get violent with her? Uh, yes, she got in my face. I believe we were both emotional at the time, and yes. What, what did you do? I don't think it got violent, I would say. What do you, did you do to her? I pushed her back full hand. The date of this yard sale, um, same date as your mom's birthday? I believe it was. At the time, I did not know. You did not what? <laughs> no, this is getting so painful. The yard sale was on the same day as Kendi's birthday? Wow. Daniel Howard. Sure, you go really low, huh? What your mom's birthday is? Uh, no, sir, I can't remember off the top of my head. But that yard sale was on her birthday. Yes, sir, I believe so. Uh, thank you. No further questions. Here you are. What manner... What manner did Brooke arrive? Or describe the manner in which Brooke arrived to the yard sale. Um, angry. Did she drive or walk? Uh, she drove there. Yes. Can you describe how the vehicle was 
coming into the driveway quick, slow? Uh, quicker than the average pace. Okay. And uh, how would you describe her demeanor? Uh, angry, emotional. Yelling? Yes, sir. Is that, is that when your dad uh, made a statement about being trespassed? Objection, Lee. Can you rephrase your question? When did your dad make the statement about trespass? Uh, not too long after she arrived. After was it after uh, there was some yelling? She actually leaving. Can you describe the order of events from when she arrived? Um, I believe she. Came in the driveway, got out of the vehicle, um, started yelling. Um, I believe she was on the phone. And then my dad then said she was trespassing. Now, going back to counsel's first question, when you you did talk to Sergeant Lallaton, what was her? Is that right? Jason Lee. As foundation. Question, Did you talk to Sergeant Lawton, Detective Order? Uh, yes, sir. When was that? Uh, I can't recall. Maybe a few weeks after, after my mother's death. Still fresh with emotions at that time? Uh, yes, sir. Then when you remember counsel asking you about uh, why would people think you did it or he did it? I'm sorry, you could that. Remember counsel asked you about why would people think you did it? Yes, sir. Um, were you aware of any aggressive conflict or opinions? on your mom's side of the family? Uh, yes, sir. Was that expressed quietly or loudly? Uh, I'd say pretty loudly. Posted on social media? Objection. Mm -hmm. I'll rephrase. Was it posted on social media? Yes, sir. Just once? Uh, multiple times. Just one day? <laughs> I believe multiple days. <clears throat> Just by one person? Uh, multiple people. At that time, uh, well, you testified earlier. Remember, counsel asked you if, if, if you examined evidence and believed your dad did it, would, would you believe evidence or you remember something along those lines? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, at that time, um, had had there been any evidence presented to you? Uh, not really, no. Uh, like my mind is stuck on this too. <laughs> uh, so I'm thinking the jury's also thinking about that. I don't know if they're going to get that out of their mind at all. Uh, Austin says if his wife truly took her own life, a grieving husband wouldn't throw all her crap out on the driveway on her birthday for a yard sale. Right? Had you testified at a hearing in this matter at that time? Yes, sir. You testified at the the grand jury, yes, um, sir. the council showed you some documents there? Uh, yes, sir. And um, when was that? The grand jury? Yes. Uh, last, beginning of last year sometime, I think. Okay. And uh, so in 2023? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Prior to that, had you uh, been presented any evidence? Uh, no, sir, I don't believe so. Okay. Yeah, you kept an open mind? Yes, sir. 
Did you keep an open mind? Yes, sir. In your interactions with your mom's side of the family, did you perceive that they were being objective? Objection relevance and cause Sustained. What was, uh, did you interact, we, we talked uh, about, um, the council asked you about beliefs. Did you believe that there was conflict from your mom's side of the family? Towards my father? Yes. Uh, yes, sir. Did you believe, based upon your interactions with them, that they had their mind made up? You remain objective today? Objection. Do you? Do you re I'll rephrase. Rephrase. Did the council ask you about the selling of chickens? Did you take that as uh, a derogatory towards your mom? Objection. Relevance to this witness. Do you object to the during the interactions at the art sale, did you have opportunity to observe your dad? To what? Observe your dad. Uh, yes, sir. You interacted with him before? Yes, sir. After? Yes, sir. You loved your mom? Yes, did you love your mom? Yes, sir. Did his demeanor to you express, uh, what kind of feelings to your mom did his demeanor express to you? Objection, culture, speculation, and relevance to this witness's opinion. I'm sure we'll follow the question. All right, please. The yard sale, did you take offense to the yard sale? Objection relevance is to whether you took offense or not. Overly objection. You can answer. Can you repeat it? Did you take offense to the yard sale? Uh, no, not really. Why? I don't know, I just didn't. Okay. I don't think that question is helping the defense's case much. Did you take offense to the yard sale? I mean, I would, I know the defense is asking now, but like, especially because it was on your mom's birthday. No. Oh dear. Did, uh, at the yard sale, did, your dad uh, get physical with anyone? No, sir, he didn't. Okay. Did you kind of, did you step in between or, or like, did you play peacemaker? I wouldn't say peacemaker. No. You and your, you and your sister were in a disagreement? Yes, sir. Did you, uh, were you and your sister in a disagreement? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. I don't know if it's Thank you, sir. You see, I looked at his dad as he walked out, just like, whoa. <laughs> That's a lot of loyalty there towards Dan, right? Even though he did say that if he knew all the facts, he might change his opinion. That's going to be so tough. If he's able to, obviously, he is afterwards, after this trial, able to watch all of this. Man, that's going to be 
difficult. Is that your last witness for today? Yes, sir. Right. Um, well, Mr. Jerry, I told you before, I, I think that um, we are done for today, and we will take tomorrow off and be back Monday. So um, thank you again for your patience. I know it's, it's been a long day with a lot of in and out, and, and you waited while we discussed the things. So I appreciate your patience with that. Um, yeah, I, I almost feel like I'm insulting you by saying it, but I really have to, especially as we go into a weekend. And, um, and I just remind you to stay away from any news, media. If somebody wants to talk to you about this case, you know, we can't walk away. Uh, I don't have any discussions with anyone about this case. We're, we're forming an opinion as to its merits uh, at this time. Uh, with a sincere thanks to the court, I'll release you for the weekend. I wish you well, and look forward to seeing you back Monday night. There he is. We'll get <laughs> At the end of day nine, you get a real close-up here of his ear. Okay. Are you enjoying it? <laughs> Camera person did it just for you. Wow. I don't, I don't think that Wyatt's testimony helped the defense at all. I think it helped the state. If the jury is thinking anything like we're thinking, many of us, just like, wow, to me, what sticks? And I'm still just like, wow. Yard sale on Kendi's birthday. That is just so cruel. This guy is so cold. Oh, my goodness. Let's see if they show a little bit more here. How many seconds have I got? Yeah, it's about a, a, a 40 seconds. Enjoy. <laughs> Look at him. Day nine, complete. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. We have to make sure we can see the whole word that I make for you. Otherwise, it's complete. <laughs> complete. Day nine, complete. Okay. So thank you for watching day nine with me. We're going to have to process all of that now. Oh, my goodness. Poor Wyatt. I know some people will be angry with him. will be like, what? Like you pushed your sister and you did what now? But just think about the way that Dan Howard influenced him, controlled him, the parental alienation, the manipulation. Oh, wow. <laughs> Someone says, Terry Lindrock says, can you hear that guilty verdict? I wait. Yeah, I think I hear it. I don't think the jury will deliberate for long, but I'm just guessing. We don't have a crystal ball. We don't know. On Monday, they're going to continue, which means uh, now we've had, by the way, if you're not going to listen to me waffle for a few minutes yet, quickly. We're going to have a member stream right after this. So if you are a member, make sure you look at your notifications, okay? I'm going to put the link in the chat during the outro. I won't be long now. I just want to say how many witnesses we've had. So we've had eight. No, seven. We've had seven defense witnesses. The one was a recalled witness. So if there's nine witnesses and they said there's going to be an expert for the defense on the stand on Monday. I'm not too sure right now who that is. I have to remind myself. Then there's two witnesses left for Monday, which means... I don't know. Some witnesses can testify all day. <laughs> maybe they go to Tuesday. Maybe they wrap up on Monday, which means verdict watch. So maybe we'll watch that live, but just with a little bit of delayed coverage, you know? Okay. So thank you so much, everyone. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to do the timestamps after the member stream. And I hope that if you've missed any of the days, you can catch up over the weekend. Okay. <laughs> AC's like, what? A member stream? Absolutely. Our snort tanks are full and we've got things to discuss. <laughs> So it's happening in half an hour. Okay, you should get the notification for that now. Okay, so thank you, everyone. Happy Friday to you. Thank you for spending a majority of your Friday with me if you were here. For me, it's already evening. And I will see you all back on Monday then for the trial. But make sure that you are subscribed with your notifications on because I cover lots of cases and I've got lots to update you on, of course. And everyone keeps asking if I will do an update on Madeline Soto's case. I will. I will at some point. It's just been very hard to talk about based on those charges and everything, but we've got lots to talk about. Okay, so I'll see you again soon. 
Have a nice weekend. Bye.